you either live by the gun or you die by the sword. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. I'm Nico. And I'm Chris. And we're back for Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, Part 2. So many rings. Yes. And uh, it's not like we haven't only been away for about an hour for a del- lunch. A delicious lunch. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, we're, we're back. Um, second part of The Fellowship covering. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, we are doing this in two parts. Because this is too much movie for even... For even us to cover. Yes. I think I forgot to mention in the first uh, in the first episode that how we're breaking this up is we are stopping the episode where the DVD ends. Yes. Regardless <laughs> of the awkward posi- timing. Because you know what? If it was good enough for Peter Jackson, it's good, good enough, enough for, us. for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so where we left off on the Fellowship, uh, that had just been founded. Um, Pippin was being a dipshit as usual. An adorable idiot. Yeah. And uh, we pick up uh, with some scenes about uh, uh, Gilrain and Aragorn's mother's memorial, uh, and which Aragorn is still on his forced destiny. And this is the only time I am going to fully complain okay. about, about, about a costume choice in this movie. Oh. Not just this movie, but all three movies. I firmly believe that the costuming in this trilogy is as close to perfect for me as possible. Okay. It's fanciful. It's incredibly detailed. It's beautifully done, except for whenever Aragorn is wearing not ranger-esque clothing. Oh, when he's looking regal and kingly? And beer gutty. It's The belt just scoops the beer gut too much for, uh. me, for me. It's too velvet. Yeah, I don't like the I do not like the velvety outfits yeah. for the most part either. It like I I know what they were trying to do. I know it was supposed to be like a mix between the men's clothing, which mm-hmm. was very tunic style, very regal, and also like a bit of touch of the elvish to show like he was raised by the elves. Yeah. He's more delicate. Doesn't Arwen have like a full velvet dress at some point too? I think so. And like but honestly, that's easy to overlook because she has a see-through dress later that we all get to see her titties. And, like, how can you complain <laughs> about that? Yeah, I'm sure there's... But while she is beautiful, full tits out, yeah, her man over here looking like he's had too many beers and... <laughs> he he feels... Okay, I see what you mean. He feels very stereotypical Renfair. It, yes. It's yeah. too... It's too standard king affair for Renfair. Where everything else in this sh- movie, for the most part... Some of it's a little stereotypical, but, like, it's thought through stereotypical. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, a a little bit, so. Yeah, this one is the one thing that feels like someone else dressed Aragorn, not himself. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, so, like, Mommy put on the outfit for Aragorn today. This was his fancy clothes. He keeps it at Elrond's house. (laughs) It's the shirt that uh, Arwen bought for him. (laughs) Yeah, so that he could come see your dad. Yeah. But he hates the shirt, but he still wears it because he's a good boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what it looks like. And uh, speaking of beer guts, what are we uh, drinking today? More ale. More ale. Prost. Prost. Do they have any slits in Middle Earth? I'm sure the dwarves do. Cheers. Cheers. There's many a drinking song. I have no doubt that toast is something in... At least one of the languages. Oh, yeah. I just don't think it's ever spoken. Maybe in the second movie. Or no, mm. no, the third one. I don't know. Maybe in the Rohan drinking scene? That's where I was thinking, too. I know there's that drinking game, but I don't think they ever have, like, a cheers. There's just a really solid burp, I think. Very solid burp from Gimli. Perfect. Ten on ten. <laughs> <laughs> but from here, we cut to Bilbo, who is uh, gifting Sting in his Mithril mail to Frodo. I I like the final interactions of Bilbo and Frodo, and I wish this had been bigger in the theater version. Mm-hmm. Most of the stuff cut for the theater version, I feel like I understand. But I do feel like the relationship between Bilbo and Frodo was hurt pretty badly by the theatrical yeah. version. Most of it was understandable, but really, like, this scene, because we have to explain... The sword and the mithril mm-hmm. felt awkward in the theatrical version. Yeah, because we cut from well, yeah, because it is it is a weird part because we kind of have like 
a restart to the journey at this point where yeah. it's not really like it's it's kind of like a soft reset where instead of just the hobbits like going on a little quest to deliver a ring to Rivendale. Yeah. Now they have to be equipped and prepared for what's ahead. Yeah. And I think in the director's cut with all of the extended scenes, it, it flows really nicely because we finally get that wrap up of Bilbo passing the torch really fully onto Frodo mm -hmm. and kind of preparing him more than he was prepared when he first set out. Yeah. Knowing that like, this is probably more than what I did. Yeah. And also he mentions that he doesn't need them anymore because as mm -hmm. much as he wanted to go on an adventure, which uh, granted it's been 17 years. So I, I actually he didn't don't... try that hard. <laughs> well, I mean, but 17, he's also old. Yeah. 17 is a uh, decent to go. And as we said, the, he is looking more decrepit. He doesn't have the ring anymore. He definitely like, He's not getting around as well as he used to. No, exactly. And also because I'm a nerd, mm -hmm. um, and Mithril is used in so many RPGs. So many. Those spelled differently than Tolkien. I learned it does actually come from Lord of the Rings, and specifically from the Sindarin language for Meath, which means gray, and Rill, Rill which means glitter. Aw, oh, shiny gray gl glitter. Gray glitter. Yes. Cute. Um, also, Cinderin's an elvish tongue. Of course. Yeah, just to get perspective, because a lot of people don't know what it is. There's so many languages. <sighs> so many. Um, but also in the scene, it also really emphasizes uh, the consequences of using the ring in mm -hmm. Bilbo when he has that quick turning. I also think this is for the first time, Frodo's been, a f been aware of the power of Gandalf, mm -hmm. but I don't think until this point, Frodo has had any realization of what the ring does to the person holding it. Exactly. And this is before Gollum, because we do have hint, hints later on, because Frodo at least knows of Gollum. Yeah, he would have been part of Bilbo's stories. Yeah, but he doesn't, there's not that connection of like, oh, this is what the ring does over a couple hundred years to a person. I'm not even sure if Bilbo knew that no. that's why Gollum was the way he was. No, it was his magic ring he found in a random cave. And then a creature, and like I don't think Bilbo ever realized that Gollum was like kind of a hobbit. Yeah, he just pitied the creature. Yeah, he was a creature, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I was going to try and kill him. Yeah, that's <laughs> not good. <laughs> and so uh, now the Fellowship's set out in good, gar in good garb. Um, I do love this moment too, because as they're leaving, Gandalf is still very much there behind Frodo. And there's that nice little interaction of Bill or Gan or Frodo looking up saying, Hey, or is like, which, which way is it? Left or right? Yeah. Left or right. And Gandalf says left. Yeah. Yeah. I also like that we get to see the edge of this elvish town mm -hmm. because it kind of looks like it almost pitters out as opposed to having like a hard edge yeah there's the little archway that they go through that feels very like gothic romantic and then some gardens that clearly someone's keeping a little bit yeah like it, it doesn't feel like a hard edged city like a lot of the other ones do yeah it feels more in tune with like the shire or hobbiton where it kind of sprawls a little yeah it's very much um it's uh well, what's the uh, right term? It's, um, oh, I was, I was just thinking of, like, how it's so solid compared to, like, the rest of the uh, of Rivendale that we've seen. Uh-huh, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, from here, uh, well, first off, New Zealand's so goddamn beautiful. So pretty. Um, but the path is laid out that they're going to head for Rohan, which is a little bit, if I remember right, south of where they're at. I think so, yes. Um, so they're going to go, they're going to try and uh, hit them up to get across the Misty Mountains or go around the Misty Mountains. Yeah. And I know there's a part in this where everyone's like, well, there's so much more powerful people they could have chosen. Why didn't all these other people go? Well, and the best part is that all these people are pretty low profile in comparison to anyone else. The only... They really are. Yeah, the only kind of big names besides Aragorn. Aragorn's kind of a new big name to the scene. Yes. The only big names are uh, Boromir. Mm -hmm. and, and even then, he's just kind of... He's the steward's son. He's not even like... King. He's, he doesn't have the potential to be anyone, really. Yeah, but and also they've been having a steward for so long that at that point, it's... Yeah, yeah he's, he's going to be the Gondor, steward next yeah. one. Yeah. And then Gimli, son of Gloin, who's... Who's big in just the dwarf world, though. Yeah. Outside of 
outside of that group, he probably wouldn't be a big name. No, just his dad would be at this point. Yeah, and even then, I don't, I don't know how much that would really like draw attention to them. Yeah, especially it... since the dwarfs seem to keep to themselves so heavily. Mm-hmm. And Legolas, despite being a prince. Has been wandering around mindlessly. For... <laughs> he's been wandering around the north with Aragorn. So, like, clearly he's not, you know, flashing any names. No. And then you got a bunch of children. Yeah, basically. Well, actually, I think the only adult in it is Samwise and Frodo. Yeah, both Merry and Pippin are very young. I can't remember if they're, like, of Hobbit age or whatever. No, I at least how the movie portrays it, I think they're just... I think they do specifically say to, like, Treebeard, just shy of. Just shy of? Yeah. yeah. Or, no, no, it's in the book. It's in the book. Um, it, Right, it's in the book. It's not to Treebeard. It's uh when Pippin's in um Gondor. Yeah. When he's uh at uh, Minas Tirith. He's oh, He's talking yeah, yeah. to one of the guard's kids. He's like, they're like, oh, are you a kid? And he's like... No, I'm th- I'm 32. I'm just in your eyes. I look like a kid, but I'm just shy of an adult. Yeah, yeah. And then Gimli would have been barely an adult. Gimli's old as shit. Yeah, but dwarves live forever. Yeah, so do elves. And that, well, so that's the thing. I did try looking up some of these ages. Um, Legolas, we don't know. Like, we don't know who Legolas's parents are. I mean, not really. And on top of that, we don't know when he's born to begin with, so... A problem with a lot of the elves, really. Yeah, so we can assume that Legolas probably has been around longer than Gandalf, at least in physical form in Middle-earth. Um, but Aragorn, it's mentioned later on, he's in his 80s. Yeah, which translates to 50s because he's got the extra old people blood. Yeah, he's got the Isildur. Yeah. Or not Isildur, the Numenorean genes. Exactly. Which shows why he's the true heir. Exactly. Um... But yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's an interesting setup. It's like a it's a bunch of middle aged folk and a bunch of twenty somethings running around the countryside. Yeah, as any good old journey should be. It's like yes, just shy of Charles Manson. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we've got Gandalf, who's technically immortal and was like the third group Gandalf of beings ever created. Gandalf cannot count as the adult in this company. At this point, he can. No, I. That is like sending children out with the dangerous uncle. No. Gandalf is Gandalf <laughs> is the dangerous Gandalf uncle. Is the dangerous <laughs> uncle. <laughs> uh, and so, um, the path is laid to make for the Gap of Rohan because as they're just kind of screwing around, there's crows or some some type of birds. Yeah, it's not. Oh, yeah, I got that coming up. Um, but well, th- no, right now they're talking about their path because. Gimli brings up that they could go through the Mines of Moria. It's a possible route because his cousin lives there. Um, yeah, and this is this is why I say I don't think even though he's son of the famous like party that brought back the lost city, mm-hmm. this place has been how long since anyone talked to anyone in Moria? It's been a long time. And yeah. That, well, that's the thing is like all the Dorvish... Uh, societies are so disconnected and like they're they haven't been part of the world for for a long time the the dwarvish society is also in decline as well very yes um but in this moment as well we get a little bit of bonding between like boromir and the hobbits they're having practice fights he's kind of teaching them but they're kind of this is for me a important scene because without this boromir would appear to only be a bad guy Mm mm-hmm Whereas this kind of shows that he's he's not really sure of himself either. Yeah. And even then, he's not... He only starts to appear as a bad guy to Frodo. Yes. Everyone else, for the most part, sees him as just a like a guy. He's, yeah. He's, he's teaching them how to defend themselves. He seems fairly like lighthearted for mm-hmm. these scenes. But that shadow never quite leaves him. No. no. And we get that in mainly... Actually, scratch that. He does have a little bit of, like, rivalry slash there's tension between him and Aragorn. Yeah, it's... He's forever awkward around Aragorn. Yeah. Well, it makes sense because of their history. Yeah. And also, he just accidentally insulted him in front of a lot of important people. Yeah, but Whoops. to be fair, he also didn't know who he was. The, I don't know if that group cares. No, not really. <laughs> I don't think the dwarves even care that he's the... Oh, no, the dwarves do not give any shits. The only reason they're there is because free food. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, I don't mm-hmm. doubt that. <laughs> but all this is interrupted by uh, 
Crebane or mm-hmm. Carabane. I don't forget how it's spelled. Yeah. From Dunland that flock overhead. Um, a bunch of crows. Yeah, but it's all. I like that this is brought up because it's used as a way to reinforce the encroaching danger. Yes. On another lighthearted moment because it keeps doing this ebb and flow through this whole movie up until Moria, where it's mm-hmm. this. Hey, there. We're going. We're going. This is going to be a nice, easy journey, right? Mm-hmm. And we're just late. We're going on a romp from the Shire. Yeah. Um, it's going to be Bilbo's journey. And like, it's it's a nice tension because while dangerous. Most of the company doesn't seem overly concerned. Mm-hmm. Like they take it seriously, but no one's like panicking that the birds might have seen them. Yeah, except for Gandalf. Yeah, and who I, I'm sure probably has more knowledge of what this is. Yeah, I mean Gandalf. Gandalf is very well aware of what's going to go down. Yeah. Um, but now the uh, fellowship is forced to pass uh, Carad Caradras mm-hmm. Caradas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm bad with some of these names still. <laughs> um, which, while they're climbing, it's kind of cute. It's, it's a nice little moment. Uh, well, not really nice. It's it's nice to see them having their hardships. Yes. Uh, because, it feels like a proper adventure. Yeah, because Frodo falls, and this is where Boromir starts to really be tempted as he refers to the ring as such a small thing. Yeah. Um, fun bit of trivia uh sean bean actually hiked up there in full get up yeah because the helicopters made him uncomfortable so like everyone mentioned that like while they're flying up to this remote peak (laughs) sean bean they they look out the window they see sean bean trudging (laughs) up the the mountain so yeah he's really sweaty in this scene (laughs) yeah i also love that during one of the interviews i think that came out after this first movie someone had brought that up to him and he was like well yeah, because that's what Boromir would have done. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> if it's what Boromir would have done, it's what Aragorn would have done. You didn't see Vigo doing that shit. <laughs> um, but also, the uh, close-up of a small thing is actually six inches in diameter. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's such a cool shot, too. It really is. They did such a great job with just scaling of everything in this. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I there's... It's a weird tension building moment because we've barely been introduced to the fellowship and we already know that we know from the beginning because of how Boromir is in the mm-hmm. uh council that there's going to be tension coming up. Yeah, I, but it's a nice extended t- tension mm-hmm. without having to like continuously add more layers or like danger to that yeah tension. it's not like he's going behind their backs and like back talking of like hey let's get rid of him kind of thing. And they don't show any like out of his way going about to be creepy or like stare at the ring mm-hmm. or anything like that it's just when presented to him yeah when he has the opportunity it, he he has very much he has more so the curse of Isildur than Aragorn has very much so even though they're not of the same well kind of, they're vaguely same but yeah yeah um but back at Isengard with another dope miniature shot so cool as Sauron commands the uh weather around them just to screw with the entire group and here we see the most wizardy thing out of all of them yeah the shouting the shouting's pretty wizardy but i i like it though i do too it reinforces the idea in magic that uh your words have power Mm -hmm. and so by saying the specific words you're creating a special effect yes um, which also screw climbing that mountain because I don't know if you caught on. They're on the edge. Like. I did. I noticed that. I also love the difference and struggle that everyone has. Mm-hmm. The hobbits are on the verge of death, having to be carried like small children. Well, yeah. I mean, when the snow's up to your hips, uh, it would have been like on the hobbits' heads. Yeah, they would have had to swim through the snow. <laughs> and Legolas is over here just loop do 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 do. Well, Legolas actually walks on top of the exactly. snow. He doesn't actually sink. No, exactly. He's mm-hmm. over here just being fine. And Gimli, bless his little heart, whose father has from day one installed in him that not only elves are bad, but Legolas's dad is bad. Yeah. Thus Legolas. Terrible person. Bad, bad Legolas dad. Bad Legolas father. He was mean to us once. So that means Gimli must plow through this snow on his own, even though it's up to his eyebrows. <laughs> Gimli's so bold. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but it's also important because, like, while Gandalf may be guiding and nudging them, 
because uh, bas- basically what happens is, like we mentioned, Sean Bean is like, hey, we got it. We, we can't do this. It's it's going to be the death of the hobbits. And He's Gimli's right. like, Moria's our only way, guys. Let's go to Moria, guys. It is warmer there. Yeah. And um, even though, like, Gandalf is guiding, he still asks Frodo, what do you want to do? Which is a nice, polite thing. Mm-hmm. Because you know that if it was up to him, they still wouldn't go that way. Yeah. Frodo is Frodo is still the one who is technically in charge of the fellowship being the ring bearer yeah even though he can't he he's real frodo really is frodo isn't a leader yeah no he has he has no leadership skills he Mm -hmm. doesn't know the way no he has almost no outdoors experience nope besides (laughs) sitting underneath a tree reading yeah he's not he would not be the top pick no not at all and i mean it is it is an interesting take that we that we look at gandalf as being the leader for the most part yeah which like by a lot of accounts, he should be. But at the same time, he really shouldn't be. No, 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 not at all. He makes terrible decisions. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, Moria doesn't mm-hmm. seem so great without what we know it's coming. That's true. Um, So now we must brave Moria as uh, Saruman foreshadows what's to be found in the city of Khazad-dûm. Ah, bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Um, and Frodo... I feel in these moments is now more realizing the peril that he's facing because Frodo is the only one who's really facing enemies from all sides. Yes. He's facing the dark forces of Mordor, but now he's really realizing that men really aren't like Strider. Like he has his trust in Strider, but But Boromir is kind of screwing with that. Yeah. And he really hasn't shown that he hasn't made a connection with the only dwarf he's ever met. And, I mean, Legolas doesn't even talk to him the whole movie. Legolas has one line to Frodo, and it's, and my bow. Yeah. And it's not really even, like, towards him. It's towards the group. Yeah, it's not even directly at Frodo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, 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 lo- I do love this scene. This is when that door first appeared. It's so pretty. It is gorgeous. It is the perfect balance of magical. Which, um... How they got that door is mm-hmm. uh, they mm-hmm. use the uh, light stripping for window or for signs on the highway. Nice. Yeah. So shiny. Yeah. No, it really is. Uh, it is. A, it is a clever technique. I think I've seen it used like once or twice before. And it's just all the editing. It's how they get the initial glow and then they just Add enhance. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, I think the Dwarven password is kind of so simple. It's dumb. I fully agree. Yeah. I I appreciate it because there is an underlying, like, story arc between Gimli and Legolas and how Mm -hmm. just because your ancestors were dicks to each other doesn't mean you need to be. Yeah. Look, you're, at one point you guys were friends. Yeah, it's like, hey, this is an elvish door. It's not for a door for use, it's for elves to use. Yeah. Um, But also it shows that Gandalf really has aged. As he mentions, he says, I used to know all the words. Yeah. So his time on Earth or in Middle Earth is taking its toll on him. Um, The effects of the pipe weed definitely are affecting him. Yeah, but does that stop him from smoking it? No. Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) But also I think it shows that Gandalf is too clever at times yes because he's trying to like he's thinking of it more of a riddle rather than well he's thinking of it like a wizard puzzle yeah whereas the answer is hobbit riddles yeah very simple like yeah pretty straightforward answer yeah um but as is the case pippin continues his fuckery Ah, uh, dear sweet pippin uh he shows his childishness and lack of caring still as he's Tossing stones in the water, making a loud ruckus. Despite being told not to. Yep, but you can't fault him. I mean... He's got to be bored out of his fucking mind. I I throw rocks in water. Oh, everyone does. It's It's natural instinct. It's now the new For My Male Audience Uh, Yes, that and breaking ice. (laughs) Yes, I agree. It's very nice. (laughs) Uh, But they're able to get in, and to Moria they go, but all is not as it seems as they discover death in goblin arrows. (gasps) Oh, no. Also, what the fuck is Gimli talking about? As, well, later on. So in this part, like, he's like, oh, the, the, it's so beautiful. Look at this. This is real building. This is real craftsmanship. And we get actually into the mining a little bit. And it's like, 
this is kind of a shithole, Gimli. Like, even yeah. if it was well kept, like, you got doorways. Everything else is just, like, barely standing arches, like, that aren't even, like, decorated. It's all just... I, I very much get the impression from Gimli that he has never actually been to Moria. Nope. And he's thinking of it in the same sense of the halls that he's seen. Yeah. Which it, are much more impressive. It's kind of in the same way that uh, Frodo romanticizes Bilbo's journey. Yes. Like, yeah. he's like, oh, it's going to be this kind of journey going forward. Where and, Bilbo conveniently left out all of the times that he was wet on a pony. Oh, God. I I re-listened to The Hobbit, and Bilbo is such a whiny little bitch. You, now you know where Frodo gets it. Yeah. Well, Fro- Frodo's not even that whiny. Uh, Frodo isn't that whiny Fra- compared Frodo to... Frodo is emo bitch. And yeah. Bilbo is a whiny bitch. Yeah, they're yeah. They've, they've, they're carrying different weights. One really wanted to go on an adventure. One really didn't. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, but as they try and flee Moria, uh, Pippin's fuckery has uh, alerted what is called the Watcher in the Water. I love this monster. It makes no sense outside of the book context. In well, the movie world... No no logic, love it. Well, in the book, it's not very described as well. It's very Lovecraftian in its description. Yeah, but it, it has a place mm-hmm. in the books. Whereas in the movie, first off, we have to have a visual of it. Mm-hmm. So, giant octopus, Roger, check. Why not? Why is there a giant octopus in the mountains in a small pond? There is a mystery of it. Um, They think, if I remember right, it's one of the uh, creatures that escaped Angband or something. Um, yeah. And th- don't don't take my word for this. I can't remember. I did a little reading, but and like I completely the, forgot. And in the books, if you dig far enough, mm-hmm. someone has found the answer. That's the beauty of the Tolkien world. Well, and well, that's the thing. I don't think the watch. Well, I think the watch is one of those ones that doesn't have a concrete answer. Like it came and it's there. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. Of, like the color from space that no one knows where it came from. It's just there. Yeah. Whereas in the movie, you just get to accept it. Yeah. And but I like it. Um, I do too. I think it's a really cool design. The fight scenes like high speed and interesting, mm-hmm. which is really nice because while. You know, New Zealand is beautiful. I am a little tired of walking. Yeah, it, it breaks that up a little bit because yeah. there's quite a bit more walking still. This, honestly, this whole franchise is just walking. Yeah, it is and a like long cross, walk. And cross-country running. <laughs> I just realized Lord of the Rings has similarities to Death Stranding. And Forrest Gump. <laughs> I just felt like walking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but little designs notes, uh, the tentacles have two fingers and an opposable thumb, which they use to give it a kind of reaching appearance, uh, appearance, like it's, it's, um, snatchy, snatchy. Um, and it's also to show that, uh, Sauron is not the only creature being drawn to the ring's power. Yes, I do like that. I also like that it's not too directly recognizable. Yeah. Because if it was just a standard octopus, Mm -hmm. would have been like less of a monster. Less yeah. of a ethereal being. Yeah, and so, like, I... One, I love Lovecraftian horror, as we mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just so weird and out of place in the world that it's 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 an interesting aspect to yes. have. Yeah. Like, it... And it's very shortly lived, too. Yeah, it's... We don't get to play with the idea of the larger beings a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Especially in the movies. Yeah. And also, like... It, it's a cool action scene. It's the first real bit of action we've had in this movie because this is the first like proper action we get of like Legolas, yeah, and Boromir, yeah. Because th- there was one thing. What was it? I can't remember what I was talking to. There's that really cool shot where like the accuracy of Legolas because he shoots yes. through them all, moving to shoot it in the face. Yes, but yeah, it's a really, it's an intense moment, and it was scary as a kid. Oh, it's and it still has a few jump scare like elements to it, which really mm-hmm. help. Like, it, they're not directly a jump scare, but they do kind of give you that little pop, mm-hmm. which, again, like we've said, really lends into Peter Jackson's background mm-hmm. of, like, knowing how to make a good monster. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the build up before it, too. Like, you didn't know what was in that lake. You no. just knew not to touch the lake. Well, they were just telling Pippin to stop because he was being obnoxious, pretty the, much. Yeah. And also, it's implied, like, Legolas is, like, I think, um, 
Yeah, let's not touch this water. This water is weird water. Well, well, yeah, and I don't think anyone really knew exactly that that thing was there. No, definitely didn't, which is part of the, like, yeah. nice little, like, trickle of horror element. Because this path was also forgotten, too, mm-hmm. so. And also, it's completely gone now, because as they're trying to flee, the creature, the watcher's grabbing the yes. doors and pulling them down, which causes the cave-in. and So cool. It's very well done. Uh, but now we are into Moria. And Moria uh, is such a delightful place. Totally. Uh, but little bits of world building that I like is that um, in Khazad Doom, mm-hmm. while they mentioned that gold is nice, but uh, they were really after mithril in these mines. Yeah, much They're, more expensive. They mentioned that they got to dig deep for that. So um, deep that we might mess something up. Yeah. Uh, Moria was also one of the first uh, bigotures done. Mm-hmm. Um, as for the design, uh, and we see little bits of it here and there. Yes. Uh, the Dwarvish architecture is supposed to be uh, geometric and not curvilinear unless mm-hmm. necessary. Yes. Um, but we also, it's supposed to be inspired by Art Deco, but I can see a little bit of like monolithic and brutalism in it. I can definitely see some brutalism. But brutalism isn't as, isn't as ornate as Dwarvish. No, it's, it, it's brutalistic in its basic forms. Mm-hmm. But there is a level of almost craftsman yeah. to it. There's, there's a level of, like, layered detail. Yeah. And it, what makes it impressive is that Dorvish architecture, more so than any of the others, mm-hmm. is the most skilled subtractive. Yes. Because their entire city is built by doing that. Yes. And the thing that I love most about Dorvish architecture is every single instance we see throughout all of the movies, including The Hobbit, None of it is ADA compliant. No. There is nothing ADA with any of these movies. You could get away with it in Rivendell. There's at least handrails. There's yeah. at least balcony railings to keep you from launching yourself over the edge of the waterfall. In Moria? Nope. Nope. Gotta, gotta be very careful where you step. In that nice dark cave. Well, Granted, I know the dwarves like see better than others in low light, but like... Ain't nobody seeing that good. Gandalf's got a little light. Gandalf has his own little nightlight because that's his superpower. The wizards. Yeah, that's his one thing. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it's it's an interesting style because... Um, style I love is, it. I do, too. I mean, it's so it's drastically different and it's, it's unique. And you know what is very interesting is it it's currently like a popular aesthetic style yeah my brother's a uh, tattoo artist out in colorado yes. does a lot of uh art deco-ish style drawings a lot of ge- like heavy geometric overlay mm-hmm. yeah it's like if the dwarven architecture was available now it'd be incredibly popular yeah and so for those who don't know what art deco is um it's it's a style that can be traced back to the 1910s of France and American skyscrapers. Mm-hmm. But more specifically, the probably the best example is the Chrysler building in 1930s. Very Art Deco. Um, it's a style that really came a, came to fruition in the 60s, um, where like Art Nouveau, it pulls from nu- numerous influences, um, specifically Cubism and Futurism. Yeah. But it's more focused on a rigid ge- geometry and uh, material Overall, over the elegance of Art Nouveau and the hyper detailed craftsmanship, and where all of them had deeper runnings, where like it would influence art mm-hmm. and interior de- decorations and clothing. Even I would argue that Art Deco did so more than any yeah. of the others had previously, and it still runs pretty heavily. Yeah, it's still a popular style. It's just not done on the grand like high rise scale that it used to be yeah the roaring 20s and there was a lot of money to throw at a skyscraper back then oh yeah um but also of note the uh arches and the uh uh door open or the hall openings Mm -hmm. they're not arced they are very angularly yes shaped to make an arch but they're not arch arches yes um and as for the bigature uh the columns were hand sculpted resin columns and uh foam and floor ceiling they're so cool. They it's, look they look so good. It is. And as for the close-ups, only two of the large column bases are real. Which is a little mind-blowing because I would argue that throughout the entirety of the Minds of Moria scenes, mm-hmm. there's only a handful of shots that have aged really heavily. And most of them, most of the ones that have aged the most are ones that were hard to begin with. Yeah. A lot of them still 
still feel pretty seamless. And I will tell you, the parts that age are the ones where it's the people moving. Yes, it's not... I completely agree. The The bigotry still stands. Yeah. It still looks great. It's the environment. It's the people around it that feel very yes. tiny. And yeah, just they, like, they, they, they don't quite move right. Yeah, they feel almost like... Playmobile, like the mm-hmm. little play, like child playing with the toy kind of thing. Yeah, and like when we, even when it first came out, mm-hmm. they they were close to being good enough, and everything else in this movie blew you away. So you just kind of like, well, yeah, I can that. still, I can still overlook. Oh, it. Oh, I still do too. But I think a huge part of that is because the bigature was so realistic. Oh yeah, that it kind of made it hard to just kind of plop the extra characters in there. Exactly, and. Also, just, like, the way they blend everything together, because you can't tell the no. r- the real pillars from the fake ones. No, it is, I, you cannot tell. It Yeah, there's just that level of detail that went in. Um, also of note, uh, the color palette is monochromatic because it's a dead city. Which I like a lot. And the other thing that I like about it is it's dark without being that weird horror movie dark. Yeah. Where... There's, there's like three different types of dark for me. There's, I can still see what's going on, but the mm-hmm. character can't dark. There's so dark, but I can't even see what's going on. So yeah. it's like unpleasant to watch. A lot of B-horror ends up too dark. Yeah. And then this one feels like a cave. Like I can see the company. I can see what they see. I can see a few hundred feet away from them. And then past that, I know there's stuff back there, but I can't see it. Yeah. It, um, I know the dark you're talking, it's like, and there and I mean, Peter Jackson does have that B-horror background. Yes. But it's like the scene in, uh, it's at the very beginning of the movie when Gandalf visits Frodo and it's just like mm-hmm. him coming out of the darkness. Yes. Like that is well done. It is well done darkness. dark. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Also, I love the oh shit look on Frodo's <laughs> face when he finds out that the worth of just his chainmail armor is uh, worth more than all of the Shire. Yeah. 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 And Bilbo's just been hanging on to it. Yeah, not not even knowing. Not even doing anything with it. Yeah, which I, I love that they kind of hold back all that information. Because as worldly as Bilbo is, he's really not at times. Uh, he's also a, like, almost romantic, um, like, reminiscer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I very much subscribe to the idea that probably when he was gifted the Mithril, he was told that it is worth a lot. Because he also had a whole trunk that he went and got. Yeah, they gave him like a a, hor- a pony full of gold. Yeah, and then the Mithril, I think, was like a, a personal gift that he yeah. was given from one, I think from Thorin. Yeah. And yeah, Thor- it- Thorin gave it for him because he was looking for the, uh, I forget the name of the stone. Arkenstone. Arkenstone. Yeah, and so I have no doubt that Bilbo probably understood that the Mithril was expensive, but he saw it more as like a part of his adventure Mm. as like he would never sell this priceless treasure yeah so why is he gonna tell his son nephew (laughs) son nephew (laughs) that he like this thing could be worth more than the entirety of their town yeah i don't think he know i know i'm sure he's aware that it's worth something but but at the same time like he's also reached a point where like he's hoping that Frodo will go on the journey he had and meet the friends that he did. Yeah. And that shirt embodies that to him. Yeah. Same it, thing with Sting. Yeah, no, exactly. Like he's like I like we brought up earlier, he's equipping Frodo for his journey. Yeah. That he didn't have. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I have no doubt that if he knew he was going to Moria and didn't know that everyone was dead, he'd be like, I have friends there. Yeah. You should say hi. Well, yeah, because th- that's right, because they don't tell anyone of the journey. No. Because that, that's the thing. Um, what, what triggers Bilbo's flashback is seeing the ring. Mm-hmm. And so they're keeping everything hush-hush. Yeah. And no one outside the council was supposed to know what, what the plan was. It was supposed mm-hmm. to be a stealth mission. It was. Of course, you know, no one's good at keeping secrets. But the idea was stealth. No. Yeah, exactly. Their stealth mission was terribly thwarted by Sam, Mary, and Pippin. I can understand the Sam part. You just let Mary and Pippin eavesdrop this whole conversation, though. <laughs> I wa- see. So that's the thing. I wonder if Elrond knew they were there. I hope so. But like in the books, doesn't he have two like twin sons who are just as bad as Mary and Pippin? Something like that. So like, 
not trying that hard, is he? <laughs> no, no, he, he he's he's at his end in Middle Earth, and he's just like, well, shit's gonna happen. <laughs> yep, your guys' problem now. <laughs> Um, but also, uh, when, now that we know that they're completely lost, because Gandalf has no clue where the hell he's going. Fair. Where he's like, I have no memory of this place. Same. <laughs> it's also a nod that the effects of the pipe weed are, uh, getting to him. Yeah, and also, like, why wouldn't you label what door goes where? Uh. There's no directionals in this place. There's no street maps. There's no street signs. There's none in this movie at all. No. You just have to kind of guess where you are. I mean, that makes sense. I mean... To some extent, yes. Cause, but, like, there's definitely got to be main roads. People have to do trade. Yeah, and I think it's just their... Com- like, they don't have, like, the name for the road. Oh, it's like, oh, yeah, this road goes this way. But yeah. if someone forgets that where that road goes... You're screwed. <laughs> huh. Yeah, because I think when we see Bree, Bree only has, like, really a main street. Which is fair. Bree's arguably, in the scope of all this, a small town. Yeah. Interesting. But... I don't know. Yeah. But in this moment, while the uh, group takes a rest, we get our uh, first sight of Gollum. So creepy. I love it. Which, uh, this Gollum, the reason he looks a little different is uh, this was uh, still pre-designed Gollum. It was pre-designed Gollum. I, I like him. I don't hate him as like, wow, he looks so much different than Gollum later. I appreciate, though, that we do not get a lot of this Gollum. No. No, he's very brief, and we only see a ch- piece of him later on. Yeah. Once. So, it, it, there's a little build-up. There's another enemy that's completely independent of uh, Sauron in the Fellowship. I also like that we establish early on that he is a sneaky sneak. He's yeah. not. He's not the coming at you with might and muscles. He's like cockroaching his way oh. up the side of a wall. He reminds me of... Um, the H.P. Lovecraft story, it's the first one he wrote, like, when he was in high school. The one about, like, the creature in the darkness or something. Mm. It's about a guy who gets uh, lost in a in a mine or a cave, and he hears something creepy. He hears something, and he eventually kills it, but then he gets a light. He's able to see it, and it looks kind of humanish. Ah, spooky. Yeah, it, it reminds me of that a bit. Um, but while they're, wa- well, also they get direction because, uh, Gandalf doesn't remember the way at all. He just, uh, smells the way that you the air what? from here is less stagnant. Good enough. Yeah. A good enough reason. Yeah. Uh, which leads them down to, uh, the big grand hall. It's so cool looking. Which is, this is where we were talking about the architecture a little bit. Specifically the columns. Oh, it's. There, it's all columns. There is a really cool shot of when it's all over all of them to show, like, the depth of the mm-hmm. place where it's them. And then you got, like, two avenues yes. of just clear sight back. It's so impressive. It is fantastic still. Yes. Um, a whole city square under a mountain. But this is the only time we really get to see the grand potential beauty of what Dwarvish architecture is. Yeah, it, it does feel a little bit like the entire company took, A, the backdoor entrance into the place. Well, they did. And then they saw part of, like, a side area. Mm-hmm. And then instead of going to see the nice rest of the, like, halls, they went back over to the side road and exited out another back door. Well, so I think, so where they're at, they're definitely in the mine mine portion. Like Yeah, the, the working portion. Yeah, the working portion. So that's why it's not as grand or glorious as these spots. Yeah. Um... But this is where they find the tomb of Balin. Oh, Balin. Which I know um, Sugi has brought up in, like, well, where did the light come from? Because Balin. Don't argue with it. It's cool. Shut up. Exactly. And who knows? We don't, we don't, we have no clue where we are in the mountain. It could be a shaft. Yeah. And also, like, dwarves are sneaky. They're yeah. very clever. They can build things. They're clever boys. Yeah. Um, But we all... Uh, they're they're doing a little exploring. Gimli's having a breakdown. I mean, I can't blame him. Two of his father's dearest companions are dead in front of him. Mm-hmm. One of whom's not even buried. He's just rotting on the ground in front of him. Oh no, they're very dead. They're I oh don't... well, he's very very dead. But he's also like Balin's in a tomb at least, and... or he's not. Or he is the skeleton thing holding the book. I I would lean maybe towards the book as well, or the one holding the book. Yeah. Yeah, I think the tomb was set up and ready for them, 
and that's where they went to die. Probably. Yeah. Um, which Gandalf is reading that, oh, shit, shit went down. They There's orcs and shit down here. Not just some. A lot. Yeah. And the little blood smear on the last page. So sad. And Pippin being the curious little kitten he is. Oh, Pippin. Uh, accidentally knocks down some armor into a well that alerts the goblins. I like this better. This will be the one thing I bring up that's different between book and movie Pippin. Mm. Because in the book, it's a pebble. Oh. It's a small little pebble that he flicks into the well. This feels, A, like an accident. Yeah. And B, much more realistic as far as like, oh, a giant clanging armor noise just landed. And a bucket at the end. Ah, uh, the bucket. And to be fair, I mean, that's a nice like little bit of comedy that's put into the movie. Yes. But like, honestly, Pippin, he's not trying to be a disturbance. He's no. just... In the wrong spot. He is just chaos. Yeah. It follows him everywhere. Yeah, because he's a dipshit. Yeah. Um, but this part, the drumming down the well... So cool! Gave me nightmares as a child, because anytime, like, you know when you're in a shower and, like, the ra- the mm. water hits the drain at the certain spot? Mm-hmm. It would always have that sound and it would freak me out. I can understand. This is a s- legitimately scary scene. Yeah. is And, like, not just the drums, because the drums help, mm-hmm. but the ant... An insect-like quality yes. to the to the goblins. Yeah, and it, it kind of makes me think of like the drums from Jumanji. Yeah, because it's a very indication of like oh, these are shit. war drums. Yeah, there is no question about it. Yep. Um, also, side little note: um, goblin and orc are used interchangeably. Um, goblins, from what I've read, seem more consolidated to the Misty Mountain ver- variation of orc. Skinny, green-esque. Cockroachy. Cockroachy. One really big one. Yeah. Little lumpy. A little bit. They're very, uh, they describe them as, like, um, kind of anglerfish-esque. Yes. Whereas I've always, I've always differentiated with the orcs, who I find a little bit more on the elf end of the spectrum. Yes, and those are the fresher elks. Yes. Or elks. Ah, uh, the tasty elks <laughs> running through the mines of Moria. <laughs> <laughs> the fresher orcs. These ones have been living underneath, I think if I remember right, the original orcs in Moria showed uh, fled there after the uh, end of the first war. Okay. If I remember right, again, don't take my word for this. I'm not a Tolkien historian. That is a different job. Yes. But um, as they are uh, ready to fight, oh no, there's a cave troll in the Mines of Moria. I uh, thought you ought to know. I love this cave troll. Its design is so good. It's undoubtedly a troll without feeling like it's ripping off any other troll. Yeah. It feels like an original troll, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, it feels... um. Because we did see the stone trolls earlier. Yes. But it still feels different from This feels them. like a different breed of troll. Yeah. And it doesn't feel... It's not in the veins of like troll hunter kind mm-hmm. of troll or what we think of like the troll under the bridge. Yeah. It's very creature-esque it's, instead of humanoid. Yes. It doesn't appear to speak words. No, not Just at all. Just smashing. Well, and so people do like... The cast and crew said they felt sorry for the troll because really the trolls are the trolls are wild creatures for the most part. Yeah, especially the cave trolls, and they're just like they've kept it as a pet for some reason. It is a bear in a cage. Uh, yeah, exactly. But and that's the thing is like a wild animal to me is still a wild animal that can kill you. Like, oh yeah, no, a hundred percent. I just am sad that this poor creature is forced to wear a chain and then fight Legolas. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of nice little touches in this battle because we've, we're really starting to ramp up the action quite a yes. bit. Um, it, there's like all, all, all this shot and what, what helped the shot too was it was handheld. Yes. Like, it, and it, it feels very fluid. Yeah. It's right in there with the action, which we mm-hmm. don't really get in the other shot battles in this movie. No, but I think part of that is because of the tight quarters for this battle. Yes. The room is such a, like strong boundary yeah and we don't get a whole lot of like zooming flying shots to make the room feel bigger or the scene feel faster Mm -hmm. we get it from the movements of everyone instead exactly and so it it is an interesting take um but also the uh, watcher and the troll where the cruise nods to ray harry housen's uh stop motion animation style the the troll especially Mm -hmm. which we mentioned in like our second episode on godzilla 
Um, but also I love this scene too because it is really dynamic and like yes and i like that it very flawlessly combines mm-hmm. both all of the fighting styles of those who can fight and then emphasizes the panic of those who cannot fight the hobbits yeah and also it's kind of like a predecessor to um uh helms deep uh-huh. and minas tirith battles because th- it's the exact same thing they're mm-hmm. sitting there they're trapped they're having to wait yes. they're And the orcs are breaking through very creepily, too. Yes, it is. They are very, um, grabby. Yes. I also love the moment with, um, uh, Aragorn where, like, he throws his sword and just that look on his face like, oh, shit, that worked kind of moment. (laughs) Like, Like, there's there's a surprising amount of good action humor mm -hmm. throughout all three of these films. Yes. And I think the reason why it works is because without that action humor, A, this could have been a very like gorific scene mm-hmm. all of the fighting really could have but instead it leans more towards like an action role play fantasy sort yeah. of adventure where the fighting while it still feels dangerous especially from the hobbit's point of view you almost have fun with it yes yeah and especially once you switch back to the characters who can fight really well like legless aragorn and gimli Watching them fight, you're like, I mean, they're doing pretty good. Well, and have fun with it to a point, because yes. it does get serious the moment Frodo gets stabbed. Yes, you feel very sorry for him. Yeah. But also, like, he, he'd been bitching quite a lot. Well, we also know he's got the he's knee fine. so we're, we're fine. fine. But the Fellowship doesn't, so you feel sorry for the Fellowship that they've been bamboozled. You feel terrible for poor Sam. Yeah. The, the little, like, slow of his face being like... <laughs> yeah and i mean that that's the thing i mean you you've heard me bitch about slow motion in movies but this harkens back to the use of it and the repeated use of it mm-hmm. to focus on important moments and let people take in that oh shit moment yes because then we've snapped right back to the action until the trolls yeah dead. and it works well in this scene it's not like in american gangster where uh uh he shoots the dude in the head and then like it, it's a brief moment and it's so quick and then it cuts to the dude bleeding on the ground. No yep. slow motion whatsoever, but slow motion would have killed that quick, decisive mm-hmm. scene. Yeah. But it doesn't It doesn't in this. Exactly. So, but now that they've kind of warded off the first wave of orcs. And They're at the least not troll, an immediate threat of death. They uh, flee, but are quickly surrounded in the Great Hall. But, um... So creepy. They are, the goblins are driven off by the fire and the smoke. So spooky. And also one of my favorite monster designs of all time. Mm-hmm. The Balrog is so cool. They, yes. And the, his entrance is so intense because like not because we've seen how big the halls are. Yes, we are fully aware of like the ginormous scale of these mines. And just we don't even see him at first. We just see his fire and his light coming yeah. from the darkness. The glow. Yeah, that. It's so cool. Chases away hordes of orcs. Um, but also, again, noted, this is the same being as Gandalf. That was corrupted by Melkor. Um, Gandalf could have been so cool. But it was designed to be uh, like lava with a thin crust over it. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, all right. They, based on, they pulled a lot of stuff. Uh, the horns, they wanted to have bull, and the face was supposed to be bulldog-like. Okay. And there, there are some contradicting, and I think some of... The design of the Balrog didn't come across from the translation as well. Because that's been the hardest thing with Balrogs. Is and, and it's the it's in specifically in the ter- in the way Tolkien writes. Yeah. Because he says something along the lines of the darkness spread like wings. Yes. So people took the assumption that Balrogs had wings. Which I like. And in the book we see that as well because, or in the movie we see that as well because it takes very much the... Wing-like stance. Wing-like stance. But yeah, it gargoyle looks, But it has wings a little bit too. Yes. But they don't seem like useful wings for the body size. No, not really. But also just... I, I don't know. There's just... And we we also see it again in the use of language in when he says, fly you fools later on. Yes. Where everyone talks about like, oh, that's his hint that they should have taken the eagles. No. No, it's not. No. One, the eagles don't come by command. You can ask the eagles to come. And the eagles will say, fuck you. Yes. 
But also, Gandalf in the movie says fly a handful of times in regards to them running, not yeah. fly like fly with the eagles. Yes. Yeah, yeah. into the future. That'd be funny. <laughs> um, but now that now they're on the run because they're like, oh shit, something big's coming. Sprint to the most unsafe set of stairs you've ever seen in your life. But they're hella cool. They are so cool. If architects were allowed to do whatever, these stairs would exist. Yeah, well, and so, uh, of note, these stairs were taken from an Alan Lee sketch, and the script had only said that the Fellowship runs down the stairs to the bridge. I like the extra action scenes. Mm -hmm. I feel like they break up the sprinting, because otherwise, like, we've already been running, then we stopped running, then we walked, then we sprinted more, then we walked more. And now we're running again. Yep. Now at least we get to do some jumping and balancing acts. Yeah, we get it. We have to deal with not only the uh, uh, enemy that's coming behind us, but the path in front of us is crumbling. We have to yes. f- figure this out. Which... And it also helps really like solidify that like Moria isn't just like a potentially lost like at the moment. No, it's done for. Yeah, like, everything's is... collapsing. Yeah, like it is not worth coming back to even yeah it's also kind of showing that uh, not really the orcs caused this something else but did the something balrog bigger. the yeah. balrog went on a rampage at one point or yeah. at multiple points and has destroyed a good chunk of moria yeah or like a very fat cat just happened to stand on the wrong spot hobbs whenever she stands anywhere poor hobbs she's got little needle feet she does have very small feet <laughs> for a very large cat yes um but we also get the lovely line, no one tosses a dwarf, which led me down a rabbit hole about dwarf tossing, which uh-huh, yeah. I learned uh, started in pub culture in Australia in the 80s. Um, <laughs> it's course. also very controversial, as some see it belittling, but others see it as, a, it's my body, you can't tell me what to do. That is a fair observation. Yeah. I, I, I do not wish to be tossed, but I could understand the appeal. Yeah. I also, uh, because I went down this rabbit hole, uh, an average dwarf is about 150 pounds. I think we had this talk before. I'm sure we have. Yeah. Because honestly, some of my favorite actors are dwarves. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to get away from the it, history of dwarven art, uh, actors and all of the shenanigans that happen around them. That would be an interesting thing to go down, though. Yeah, I would. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting parts that they've had. Yeah, they really have. And some of them, they've made their career really off of it. They really have. Yeah. Yeah. And we're reaching a point where, like, it's not even defined, that the dwarfism isn't even defining the actor anymore. No. Which is fantastically, like, interesting. Oh, yeah. Like, look at Peter Dinklage. Like, half the movies I've seen him in, like... Beautiful. Not even brought up. Knight's a badass to him. He's just there. Yeah. He's the stoner friend. He is. <laughs> Beautiful stoner friend. Uh, and um, as well, like the... Uh, going back to the eagles real quick. Um, the eagles are powerful creatures that we also don't want them to be around the ring. No. And also, it's it's easy to forget that the eagles aren't just like eagles they are their own race they have their own stuff to deal with yeah and the ring is not part of it they've been more so there if i remember right they were created more so to watch the lands Mm -hmm. i think they were created in the first age yeah Um, like they've got their own stuff going on yeah they're they're their own thing so take that what you want eagles were never going to be part of the plan to begin with nope weren't even going to bother asking yeah but also at the bridge is where we find out how bad off a Gand- how bad off how bad off to Gandalf is. Yes, how badass Gandalf really is, as he uh, quotes, he is the servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Aenor, and Which the sounds... Balrog is the flame of Udun. So cool, but all it really means is that Gandalf is a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> I have no, I I forgot to go down what that even means. I think it just means like he. He's a servant of... Of the, the good light, yeah. Of the head head. Yes, that's uh, all it Valar. means. But all it, it turns into is, look at how shiny. Yeah, but he is a badass. He you is. shall he, not pass. And even after he like knows he can't get up anymore, he's like, all right, time to Matrix style fall down this hole and kill this bastard. Yeah. So dope. But as far as we know, he's just dying. True. I mean, it's implied that he dies anyway, so, like, eh. Again, people don't know who the wizards really are. 
Do the wizards even know? Yes, the wizards know who they are. I feel like some of them are confused. No, the wizards know exactly who they are. <laughs> they were brought over from um, the uh, por- the part of the world that's on the east where the elves go. The great, or where they leave from the Grey Havens. Oh, sure. The Undying Lands. Gandalf came from the Undying Lands to Middle Earth. Yes, and then jumped into a hole with a Balrog. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and the reason, so a little history, the reason it's called Middle Earth is because uh, before the First Age, the Earth was flat, and then um, the Numenorians rebelled, and so to prevent them from ever getting to the Undying Lands for their immortality, uh, Luvata shaped the world into a sphere so that way they could never reach it. This is my one fun fact. Are you ready? Yes. For the elves, it's still flat, which is why Legolas can see farther than everyone else. Is it? Yeah. Interesting. So it's all a matter of perspective. It is a matter of perspective. For the elves, the world is still flat. I would assume for Gandalf, the world is also still flat since he can go to the Grey Havens. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I never thought about it. That's why Legolas can see farther is because the world's flat for him. His special eyes. Special, special anime <laughs> eyes. <laughs> uh, and so uh, our first member of the Fellowship has fallen. Sad day. Gandalf Frodo's so upset. Pulled down the by the whip. Um, <laughs> kinky bastards <laughs> in his bathrobe too how dare yes I, give, I bet the bower got a nice upskirt there that's Up true Rome. Gandalf probably doesn't wear underwear <laughs> according to the one gif he does <laughs> I hope so <laughs> for everyone's sake yeah and this is another scene like we've had a lot of slow motion scenes pretty close to each other mm-hmm um, because now our main guide is gone, as well as the friend who's and been he also, lost. And he also was, like, the unifying factor between mm-hmm. all of them. Like, Gimli's not going to follow anything the elves do. The elves aren't going to follow anything that the dwarves do. Bor- Boromir has his own agenda here. Yeah. The hobbits don't know what the fuck they're doing. Legolas and Aragorn are chill. Uh, yeah, but, like... Also, Aragorn doesn't really seem too vibed to be doing this. No, he's just kind of there because it's his duty. Yeah. So, like, Gandalf not only was the leader, but, like, he was the thing keeping all of them from just, like, chaos. Yep. And now he is supposedly dead. Yep. And now they are out of Moria, crying, mourning. So sad. Aragorn's like, we must move on. This team, this, uh, this, uh, le- the hills will be swarming with orcs by nightfall. And he is not wrong. Did you see how many orcs were in there? Yeah. Um, fun fact about this scene as well. This was shot before McKellen even landed in the UK. Or, <laughs> sorry, not in the UK, in New Zealand. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So this was one of the earlier shots of the movie. Yeah, it works. Yeah. And it, it's, it's interesting to see, like, how really they planned everything. Yes. Because and... the hobbits were there the longest, and they were all together. Yes. But then people just kind of came and went as they were needed. Which they kind of had to, though, because this sucker took forever to film. Yeah, it was, what, five years in the making? Like, two, three years of prepping, or two years of prepping and writing, and then three years of shooting before it was finally released? And all the shootings in New Zealand. It's not like it's in Hollywood or London, where it's fairly easy to get to and from. And they shot in remote places, and on top of that, this was all done on film. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, like, this sucker was a bitch to make. Yeah. It's impressive that anyone put up with it. I mean... But they did, spectacularly. Even more impressive. Yes. And so now the Fellowship has to continue on to Lothlorien. All by themselves. Yeah, which uh, the entrance of Lothlorien was shot on the edge of a nature reserve and had to be built uh, 40 feet in the air to give the feeling of height because and density because New Zealand doesn't have large trees. That makes sense. Yes. They are an island. Which, it, they said it was weird, like, walking through it, and it's like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And then you turn a corner, and the tree's just all metal behind it uh-huh. and supports. <laughs> <laughs> Which they would constantly rearrange to make it so that way it didn't feel like it was the, the same, same location. Yeah. yeah. It helps a lot, because whether or not it, it necessarily reads when you're there filming. Yeah. Like, afterwards, when you're watching it, especially at home... It's so easy to tell when, like, hallways or bits of the forest have been reused, Mm -hmm. which sounds like it shouldn't be because, like, all hallways should look roughly the same, all trees should roughly look the same, but it kind of messes with your perspective. 
I've got a jab at that in the next episode. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a specific movie we watched this year. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but also there are only eight trees. Uh, they do a good job making you believe there's a lot more than eight. Yep. Which um, I love this bit because they're like, oh, we got to be cautious here. This is elf territory. Don't and worry. Gimli's sharp as fox is. He's like, oh, I would catch them before they'd even dr- draw their bows. And they're like, we, we could hear you in the mm-hmm. dark, you dumb bastard. You breathe like my roommate's cat with <laughs> asthma. Yeah. Uh, and so um, this is r- like, we didn't even really see this. There's like a little tension between Gimli and Le- uh uh, Gimli and Legolas. Yeah, but this is really our first part of animosity with our first animosity between the uh, dwarves and the elvish. Um, yeah, because with... for the most part, while there's definitely tension, Legolas is pretty chill about it. Yeah, I mean, at least he not verbally like well against the dwarves. And Legolas's dwarves are, or sorry, Legolas's elves are of the wood elves. Yes, so they're from a different portion. And they're, you know, ruled by Dick Ass McGee. Yeah, the Lothlorien elves have a huge feud with the dwarves of yes. Moria. Who Be- are very dead. Yeah, but they it, it stems from what was called the Dark Days. Yes. Um, and the dwarves haven't forgotten, but I would argue that not that a lot of the elves very much feel like, well, that wasn't me. No, uh, some of them it was some, them. Some of them A was. lot of them it was them. Yes, but they definitely put on airs much better than the dwarves, who are all together mostly proud. They really don't, though. Like, the do- the elves are very... So here's the thing. The elves are like the Canadians in this moment. Yes. Where they're very politely dickheadish. Yes, exactly. Uh, Whereas the dwarves are openly racist. They're Americans. <laughs> they're very American. <laughs> uh, in some regards. Like, because there, there's that one part where they're like, oh, uh, Gimli's like, oh, well, that's the hospitality? Well... Whatever he says to them, and then Aragorn's like, you're a fucking asshole, man. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't very Aragorn's nice. Aragorn's the only gentleman in this entire group. <laughs> well, and Aragorn's a weird one, because he really is the in-between, because he's lived with elves his whole life. And then he would have been seen rather favorably by the dwarves for being mm-hmm. a ranger. Yeah. So, yeah. he's He at least knows how to walk both polite lines party. Yep. Which, uh... We are taken now from, uh, or we are now taken to Karis Galadun, which um, the design team mentioned Lothorian and chiefly Karis Galadun mm-hmm. uh, were the most enigmatic designs that they had to continue the Elvish style, but make it different from Rivendale. Yes. Um, and now is a good time to talk about the replicas because uh, these miniatures were really big. They were huge. Uh, they also mentioned a crypt on a Christmas lights. Uh, fair to light this whole sucker. Yeah, I bet. Mm-hmm. But it's beautiful. Like this is you. You have this to, is high fantasy. This is very ethereal in comparison yes. to uh, Rivendell. Felt almost like a mix between Elvish and like Hobbit or man's like style of men. This feels entirely elf. I'm gonna get to that in just a minute. Yeah. Um. But. When when I first saw this, it made me, or not not this time, but when I was playing Final Fantasy X, mm-hmm. this part makes me think of Makalania Woods as well as uh, Karis Galadun is very Weeping Willow-esque. Yes. But also it feels rather nest-like. Feels almost fairy Yeah, and it feels like they're growths from the tree. It's not, it doesn't feel like it's imitating it feels like it's naturally a part of this nature of this world magically grown yes mm-hmm. um also side note lothorian is the realm and karos galadun is the largest city within it yes um but n- not only was lothorian difficult to visualize but i completely understand where it was hard to pace just because it's really the in between of uh-huh. the climax of the movie and all the action that just happened. Yes, I mean it's it's a weird spot to have to be at, but it's if, like there's still more to do. It flows so well. Yeah, and so on to the difference between uh, Rivendell elves and the Lothlorien counterparts. Mm-hmm. Um, Rivendell elves are quite more colorful, honestly. Yeah, despite it being a 
fairly muted color palette, yes. Um, but their costumes are, all their costumes are still meant to feel like they're hung. Mm-hmm. And that way they feel taller and are allowed to glide, so that way you're not seeing their feet moving. It's very Russian dancing, like traditional Russian dancing. Yes, very much so. Um, as well, uh, like, what, if you look at Galadriel's dress, it's very ornate, but it's toned down in all the same color, really. Yes. And it it's make, almost bland. Yeah, it makes me think of wedding dress ornate. Yes, where like if you're close enough, you can really see the details, mm-hmm. but from far away, it just kind of all blends together. Yeah, and on top of that, there's this little connection between uh, wizards and elvish um, costuming. Because if you look at the wizards, mm. the wizards have very much the same. Yes. In different regards to how elaborate they are. I mean, Gandalf wearing was wearing a sack. Yeah, Gandalf was wearing homeless people clothes. Yeah. Yeah. And Sauron was... Oh, his stuff was worn, but he had been... It was, it was nicer than that. It was nice at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But, I mean, we do see it in Gandalf the way later, but... Yeah, I was going to say, we'll it comes back that. around. Yeah. Oh, and then there's Radagast, who is literally just a homeless raccoon. Yeah, well, he's got a home. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's living with raccoons. Yeah, definitely. Um, but also, the elves of this age are very brown. They're kind of wintry, too. They, like, they feel the most connected to, like, the idea of starlight and moonlight mm-hmm. than any of the other elves, I think. Yeah, whereas, like, the Rivendell are very, at this point, kind of brownish. Yeah, they almost feel like evening sunlight. Okay. I, 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 I was guessing at colors at this point. It's a little bit muted yellows, a lot of muted browns. Okay. A lot of ivories, where it's like an off-white, it's still warm, it's a little creamy, whereas these all have a very cool undertone. Yeah. So, like, it almost feels like where Rivendell is more like, more like early morning or, like, right as the sun sets sort of color palettes where it's still warm. Mm-hmm. There's still some light, but it's starting to... You can start to see a few stars. These feel like full middle of the night, full moon. Yeah. So many stars. That's their aesthetic. That's who so they are. So pasty they glow. They are literally so pasty <laughs> they glow. <laughs> Which I think is funny that we we give Twilight... Well, Twilight was a bit sparkly, too. Uh, no, that one was glitter. Yeah. That was a glitterly, glittery man-child. This is Ethereal Girl. They're, they're different. They are yeah. different. Also, these are all adults and they didn't glitter (laughs) yeah also one of them is terrible and scary (laughs) also um a little bit of design choice in regards to uh the elvish crowns they Mm -hmm. lay close to their heads yes more like a circlet yes whereas the uh, human crowns sit on top one's a little bit more subtle yeah a little bit more artistic and one's a little bit more regally yeah you know a little bit more classic king look yeah, very much so. Um, and as we were talking about the architecture, um, the diff- the big difference is a proximity to human nature. Yes. Where, like you said, Rivendale sits like Frank Lloyd Wright. Very much so. But also, the roofing is very what we assume from the men's side of architecture in mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings. Whereas, as I mentioned in uh, uh, Lothlorien, it feels very much more organic, like it's yes. part of it, and it feel that's where it feels more Art Deco. Yes, where it feels like it's part of it rather than Rivendale, that feels like it's trying to imitate it. I completely and understand. using its stonework. Yes, this one also very much feels like, whereas Rivendale's idea of intricacy was like a certain pattern and tile mm-hmm. or a certain bricklay or a few elements around columns. Yeah. This one very much feels like if you got closer, rich detail, rich lining of yeah. things you could find, but from a distance it's all just form. I can't remember who it was. There was this uh architectural designer who had a TED talk and he made he theorized like making houses out of living trees, which would be cool and not sustainable. No. That would take a long ass time. Yeah, exactly. But it's a cool idea, and that's what yes. that's what makes well, me think of Lothlorien. The elves have time. I mean, the elves have so much time to let trees grow their houses for them. Who knows when Lothlorien? Well, someone knows when Lothlorien someone was founded. Knows. <laughs> um, I didn't look it up, but uh, I mean, yeah, we're sitting at like 
we we forget how long the timeline of Lord of the Rings is because yes. just in the in the third age we are at all oh, just under three thousand years in this age, mm-hmm. which we had a second and a first age, uh-huh. and three more ages before that that were much longer that were equivalent to like six or nine of our years mm-hmm. or of Middle Earth years. So long. Mm-hmm. Now we get to meet Galadriel, who is uh. Much more kinder than her kinsfolk. Yes, but also terrifying. Yeah. Um, she got, she's got she got piercing eyeballs. From the beginning, you're all, like, you, you are put off. Yeah. Like, she, she doesn't have a, a warmth to her. She has a power to her. Yeah, she, she has a very different feel than uh, Elrond. Yes. Which, by Elrond the way, feels like elf dad. This does not feel like elf mom. Paid, played by Kate Blanchett. Yes, wonderfully done. Um, but we, if if we if you haven't recognized it at this point, she is the narrator in the pro- prologue. Yes. Um, one of the holders of the Great Rings of Power. And she is also the oldest being we have met, as she was born in the years of the tree. Which I forgot I wrote this down. Um, to be brief, the ages are there was the Anulinda line, which was the times before. Uh, then we have the Valian years, Mm -hmm. which include the years of the lamps and the years of the trees. So there's three ages right there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it ended with the rising of the sun that begins the years of the sun, which encompass the first, second, third, and subsequently the fourth age, which ours takes place in the third age. Yes. There's a fuck ton of war. I'm not going to go into it. There's a reason it's called the year of the, the years Mm -hmm. of the trees and all that stuff and the lamps and blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. But. They are now welcome to the city. Uh, the group beds down. Well, I, this, this is weird. They get like given a grove, and they're like, "Here you go." Yeah. Well, this all this all is part of your answer for beds. Yeah. I don't think the elves really have beds. I have questions about okay. that because we know they sleep. Yeah. They have to make babies somewhere. There are there are elf children. Not many, but they do exist. They happen. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, actually, I do wonder if this is actually like their sleeping quarters, or if it's just like, hey, we got a spare nook by this tree. You guys can use. Yeah, because it feels it feels a little bit like okay. Well, we had originally set up for all y'all to have your own rooms, but. The hobbits don't seem comfortable with that idea, and we don't trust Gimli, so <laughs> here's your own little courtyard. Yeah. <laughs> Stay here. Well, and so that that's the one thing, um, like, also the elves are meant to be, suppo- are supposed to feel like they're nurturing nature. Yes. Um, whereas the dwarves are super freaking destructive. Yeah, very. The dwarves and humans. In different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but while they're bedding down, uh, Aragorn and Boromir have a little bit of a bonding moment, but as fellow men. Yes, you know, the only humans on this quest. Yeah, where Boromir's trying to appear t- or appeal to Aragorn's like, dude, these are your people who are dying. We could use you the ring, man. Which honestly shows a lot of already growth for Boromir's character, mm-hmm. because when we first met him, the pride in like, no, we've been doing fine ourselves yeah. without you was strong and now we're coming he's coming around to the idea of like hey you know if you came back we could really we could do some stuff yeah we could really make a change yeah and i mean it's a brief moment as as actually actually a lot of their moments are brief i mean all of boromir is brief yes (laughs) i'm glad they brought him back (laughs) dude i am too (laughs) um but I mean, everyone's and here the weird thing too is like because everyone's still trying to lament the loss of Gandalf. Yeah, but they still got to keep going. Yes, and it's pretty clear who has the mind to like move on already. Mm-hmm. And and at the same time, we're also beginning to see the weight of the ring on Frodo, who's already not sleeping well. Everyone else is asleep. Everyone's else to to give Frodo a little credit though. There is a magic wood elf here who is speaking to him in his mind. True. I wouldn't sleep super great knowing that she's around either. Yeah. Especially because, like, he's already paranoid of people taking the ring from him. Yeah, I do forget that as well, that Galadriel speaks to absolutely 
everyone in their mind all at once in that very introduction. I would be fucking terrified if I was the Ring Bear and I'm like, all right, first off, I've got to watch Boromir, man sketchy as shit. And all of my friends are dumbasses, could be murdered at any moment. Yeah. And then that lady can talk to me in my head. Yeah, because doesn't Gimli, like, call her a witch or something? He does at first. Yeah. This is, this is for Gimli, the biggest growth is this little teeny tiny arc where he, 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 before he meets her, calls her a witch. He's heard the tales of the witch in the forest. Yeah. And then he sees her and falls deeply in love. Yes. Which, yeah, I don't think Gimli even marries. No, Gimli and Legolas both do not. They wander around after this together like bros on a road trip. Right, we brought that up, that we want to see that bro, bro trip. Yeah, I, do, I very much want to see that bro trip. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they would do, though. I don't know. Shit. Shenanigans. Shit. <laughs> Shenanigans. <laughs> but yes, Frodo is drawn away by Galadriel, who... Uh, Gets kidnapped easy. Hasn't... Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't even tempt him with anything. She just kind of looks at him and says... Frodo. Yeah, Frodo would fall for puppies and candy in a car real easy. If he knew what a car was. Yeah. <laughs> He'd fall for the car. Yeah. <laughs> um, where she has him stare into the mirror, which just looks like a water basin. I think it's a shiny water basin, and then the water helps, like, add reflective layer to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, mirrors probably aren't, like... I mean, it's... Okay, here's my theory. Here's, okay. here's where I'm going with it. A... Mirrors aren't super crystal clear, but this also kind of re-invokes the idea of, like, water starring, which is where you Mm. stare into the pool of trickly water and hope to see future envisions. Scrying? Yeah. Okay. So, like, this kind of feels witch magic-y. Yeah, very much so. Like like you said, the the magic is there, it's just kind of... Boring. Yeah. It's boring magic. I like it. I love it. But it's boring magic. I do love the everyday magic in like I shows, do too. like where in Avatar, it's like, well, of course they're going to use earth bending to move their postal system. Yeah, like, I, and I appreciate the different types of boring because in in Lord of the Rings, it's it's not even mundane. It's just almost useless magic. Yeah, it's there's like there's no practical purpose to it unless you have a specific thing that you're trying to do. And it's all about seeing the future and communicating for the most part. Yes, very much. And and causing avalanches, which doesn't seem to have a big field. Oh, and wizard fighting. Again, there's not that many opponents. I feel like we'd have the tournament done pretty quick. I mean, yeah, really, because, I mean, the two blue wizards were lost to the east. They're no, off doing their own shit. No one knows what happened to them. They're doing their own shit. They're tired of this bullshit. Radagast is doing his own shit, too. He so... would get the snot beat out of him immediately. Yeah, so we've already seen who wins. Yeah, the wizard tournament's over. Yeah, that was quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as quick as the Fellowship is going to be because... Oh, God, um... yeah. And also, um, Frodo is the worst future seer on the planet because he doesn't even necessarily 90% of this vision see the future he just sees flashes of his own friends faces well i mean part of it is it's supposed to reinforce that those are the people who he cares about really yeah i mean sweet but caring. also it's a nod to the sacking of hobbiton that was removed from the from the screen or from the movie a version because yeah it would have been long <laughs> it's a it's a long portion after the book too or after the end of where the movie ends yeah um but also like the Fellowship is falling apart, like, within 30 minutes? Yeah, like, Gandalf hasn't even been dead a whole two days, it feels like. Yeah. And everyone's already like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. This, I don't think we can do this. Maybe we should go to Gondor. But, yeah. And, but I, I also think this scene's important because it's really showing Frodo's uncertainty. Because mm-hmm. Gandalf's no longer there. Yeah, he doesn't know what to do. So, and he doesn't really have a guide. So, in this moment, he offers Galadriel the ring. Yes. And we see how powerful the ring is. I also think she's using this opportunity, though, to solidify to Frodo. Because Gandalf has just told him no. Yeah. And he's pretty much just been like, no, if I took it, it'd be bad. But, like, I don't think that necessarily meant much to Frodo. Like, Frodo doesn't have a concept of war. No. And they didn't really know what the ring was or the importance of it at the time. Gladria is physically able to show him a tiny portion of great and terrible power. Yeah, I would be beautiful and I would be terrible. As the dawn, which, yeah, same. I don't want to wake up in the morning either, girl. (laughs) Um, But I do also like that it's really 
that that testing really isn't seeing if Frodo's capable of it. It's no. more so her testing herself because the elves are out of there because she's like, I have passed. I can move on. Yeah. Well, and like she, being one of the three ring bearers for the elves, she's one of the few who probably does have to prove that she can go on without the ring of power preventing her from it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, she for those who don't know, she's the second uh, ring bearer that we have. Yes. Um, we have seen the third one, but we'll talk. I'll talk about that in the next episode. Yes. Um, but it, it also goes back to that line um, that absolute power corrupts absolutely, which yes. I think was from Marcus Parks. Yeah, but I, I think, think he pulled it from somewhere else. There is someone famous who has said that. I feel like it's someone from World War Two. Yeah, not. Not Marcus Parks, I'm no. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man, but... I don't know if I can credit him that one. No. Um, but it, it's also, like... It, it's just a... It's a weird moment within this kind of, like, semi-peaceful time. Mm -hmm. But it's also just building the tension that Frodo's not safe wherever he is. No. Even here. Even in, in what appears to be, like, the most untouched part of Middle-earth. Yeah. It also... Starts leaning into the story of Gollum a little bit, where, mm -hmm. like, he wasn't safe anywhere, so where did he go? Exactly. Underground. Deep. By himself. Um, but also, it, there's this... While they're entering, there's, like, statues of Galadriel. Yeah, she's pompous. Yeah. She's pompous as fuck. Yeah. But also, this is the scene where, like, I was looking at the set, and it feels the most ruin like mm -hmm. where despite Lothlorien being as beautiful as it is it doesn't feel energetic like a city should no be. it feels like it's dying in a different way it feels like part of the city has already left to go to the gray Havens. yeah it has a similar uh not hue but like luminescence like uh minus morgul mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah like the not all of the shops are on not all the people are home yep this is a dying city i mean there are Queen has basically said, well, I'm going to peace out, guys. I passed my test. Well, and it also makes sense that, like, she's probably one of the last people in her city to stay. Most of the city is probably gone. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, there, there's just so much. Like, there's leaves piled up and, like... It definitely feels like, like, at one point this was bustling. Yeah. Like... Even by elf standards. Like, there was people coming and going everywhere. Yeah, I was gonna say, bustling might not be the right word. Not for elves, but, like, busy. Yeah. Like, there would have been whispering of people. Like, there would have been folk coming and going. Yeah. The books talk about their love of poetry and song. This place is quiet. This yeah. place is real quiet. A lot of the places are quiet. A, a lot of the elf places are quiet. They feel... Again, they're dying cities. Yes. Because as far as we know in Rivendell, the only people who live there are uh, Elrond and Arwen. Yeah, and his mysterious sons who were not in the movie. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we see any other elves in Rivendell now that I, I think, think about it. I think there's a couple of guards. And, yeah. like, there's some people who, there's some other elves who bring food and stuff. But, like, it's a, they're running on a low staff. Like, this isn't the full crew. Yeah. that That's an interesting way to look at it because it's. They're almost like grave keepers yeah. or crypt keepers for these dying remnants. Yeah. Because on honestly, I don't think they're bringing anything like any of the books from their libraries over. They're just going to leave. They're just, yeah. Like, well, when we saw the parade that was heading off to sail to the mm -hmm. Grey Havens, they weren't taking anything. They were just on a horse heading there. Yep. With them themselves and I. Yeah, which I, I know they don't mention it in the movie or, yeah, they don't mention it at all, but... There's some conversation with uh, Legolas that one day he's going to feel the calling. Yeah. And that's part of his journey is that he feels the calling, but he still stays to finish the journey. Yeah. I think it's when he, I think it's when he enters Lothalorian is when he starts to hear that. Yeah. Uh, specifically when he gets like the psychic transmission thing. Psychic transmission thing. Yeah, sci-fi <laughs> talk for a fantasy one. Yes. I don't freaking know. <laughs> Telepathic. I don't know. Weird, weird elf lady. Yeah, but again, this scene is just to establish that Frodo is afraid to go on. Fair. Um, where we cut to uh, a birthing scene of the of the Urukai, which gross but cool. 
I enjoy this scene quite a bit. It's it's a good again, reach back into his horror days. It's a good goop. Yeah, which uh, I like. He brought it up that part of this birthing is they're uh, they're pulling them out with hooks. Yes, and like when he when the first when the Uruk- not gentle. No, when the Urukai kills. Yes, the first act it does before even breathing. Yeah, 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 and that's how he knows, and that's why he like stays them from like let him kill. That one's perfect. That one's gonna be your leader, bitches. That's my favorite one right there. Yeah, which he's. I mean that one, George. Which I always have that I always stumble upon like weird ass birthing scenes in movies. There's uncomfortable number. Yes, which at some point I might do a list of the top I ten. I have no doubt. <laughs> Gozu. Uh, yeah, that'd be right <laughs> up there. <laughs> um, but he's explaining the history of the orcs that they used to be elves, but they were corrupted by Saur- Sauron. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're also showing that. Uh, his shifting loyalty is that he's not loyal to Sauron. He Sau- really wants to be himself. Yeah, he wants to be the ruler. Mm-hmm. And he forgets that Sauron doesn't share power. Yeah. He um, he's far in, he's they're in towers far enough away that he hasn't really been beaten into that yet. Mm-hmm. But also, Sauron's orcs are mentioned to be the more superior of the orcs. Yeah, they can run around in daytime, they're much beefier, they have bigger pecs. Yeah. Nice, strong, There's some hunky boys. Nice, strong jawline. <laughs> As Psycho Gorman says, they are hunky boys and he would love them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, so now we cut back to the uh, Fellowship is now clothed in elvish garb. Fancy. And they're uh, given lembus bread. Which the hobbits proceed to immediately consume. Yeah. Mary- like, like. <laughs> Like high schoolers eating like ready to go meal rations. Yeah, they say. I think Mary and Pippin say something along. Uh, they say, uh, or sorry, the elves say something along the lines of like, a portion of it will make a man feel full for a, little, a day. A little nibble, as Legolas says, and Mary and Pippin are like, "How many did you eat? Three, four, and then he burps." <laughs> yeah, they're dipshits. I love them. Uh, and now the fellowship heads for the falls of Raros. Yes. Um. All, by the way, all the uh, rowing was legit, not CGI. And I like it because there are some very awkward rowing moments, mostly because, like, all of the boats are the same size in theory, but we have to make them different sizes for the different size people. Because on some of the shots um, with the small, with the hobbits in them, I remember, right, they had to sparingly use a guy, I think they called him, like, Tall Greg, because the dude was, like, seven foot, <laughs> which put him at, like, the right height for, like, a human next to the, the full-size yeah. actors. <laughs> so, like, they used him very sparingly, but he's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Um, But as they take off, we get a little bit of a flashback, which isn't a bad use of a flashback, especially for, like, a relatively boring moment. It's, okay, I know, like, it's supposed to be all emotional, like, this is the true start of their adventure. Yeah. Like, now they have to do it alone without Gandalf. They've had that pre-start in Rivendell, but now Gandalf's now, dead, so now they gotta re-equip. Yeah. Eh, but honestly, it's kind of boring, because they just kind of row out, and, like, they talk about the gifts that they were given. Yeah. And everyone got terribly practical gifts, except for Gimli. Uh, to be fair, that's Gimli's own damn fault. No, Gimli, this is what he wanted. <laughs> Yeah. Because he's a romantic man. He got more than he wanted. He wanted one strand, and she plucked three. He is such a romantic man. Yeah. He would be into poetry, for sure. I wonder what Dwarvish poetry is like. I hope it's nothing like that poetry from High Trekker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't remember that. It's the worst poetry in the galaxy. It's great. I've never (laughs) read- It's used as a form of torture. You would love it. (laughs) (laughs) I've, I've never, I've never actually read that book. That's fair. It's very long. (laughs) Um, But in a way, like these starts and stops for me feel like this, like how we play an RPG. Yeah. Where like it's you start up, you do a little bit. You get through the tutorial. You grind a little bit and then you go back to town. You restock, grind Uh out a little bit more, advance the story. You finally get some decent weapons, some decent armor. And then you really get rolling. Exactly. but it also real the flashbacks also really help develop the characters and add a little bit more later on. 
Um, because now we're also showing that Aragorn is really taking on his burden a bit more seriously and has kind of become the default guide. I won't call him leader because Frodo's still supposed to be the leader. But he's the next as far as like how to get to places he knows the best. Yeah. Because while theoretically Legolas has like run around Middle Earth the most, he seems bad with directions. He kind of just wanders around. Yeah. Yeah. Joining groups as he goes. Yeah. Whereas Aragorn definitely seems like he, at least in his head, knows how to read a map. (laughs) Yeah, more so than Gandalf has no memory of this place. Oh, goddamn it, man. Couldn't have brought a map of Moria. I wonder if they would even have a map of Moria. It's possible, because they were friends, and that was the friendship door. That he forgot the password to, so not much of a friendship there. (laughs) It's like forgetting a secret friend handshake. That's true. He's a bad friend. Yeah. Um, But most of all, Frodo is given the light of Arendil, which is pretty symbolic. And it's basically Galadriel has given him a little bit the last light of hope from the elves. And in a way, Frodo's the last light of hope for Middle Earth. So cute. So symbolic. Yeah, which is nice because... Elves don't give a shit anymore. They really don't. Man, they really don't. Except for really uh, uh, Elrond. Yeah, but part of it feels like Elrond's only giving a shit because his daughter's really into humans. Uh, no, not even that. Because he's completely... Again, I mean, remember, later on he he's, he completely tells her that, hey, uh, oh, no, there's he... nothing for you here. Peace, get out. Yeah, as any concerned father would. Yeah. When he finds out his daughter is dating a terrible... Man, homeless. Homeless wreck of a man. Homeless Rasputin looking man. <laughs> grimy, grimy man. Hey, oh, what was it? When people were referring to the guy who, who's in The Witcher where they're like, he grimes up good. He does grime up good. That's yeah. the whole reason anyone Or grimes watches. down good. He, either way, doesn't matter. Man's much more beautiful as Witcher than as Superman. Yeah. We, we both definitely have the very similar taste in the rugged looking guy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Roll them through the dirt. <laughs> uh, gross, but... But yeah, attractive. But, yeah. <laughs> um, which, while they're r- rowing down, they decide to rest a little bit, where uh, we learn that Gollum is still following them. Like a toad on a log. Yeah, very much so. Just kind of hanging on there, paddling with one hand. Just watching. Much but, like Hobbes. <laughs> actually, yes. <laughs> Ob knows where the dry food's kept now, so occasionally the door's just slightly open. But she'll just sit there and stare at you with her blank eyes. Ah, oh, beautiful blank eyes. Uh, Fat little body. So chubby. Um, but also in these moments, Sam is very fatherly to not just Frodo, but Merry and Pippin. More so to Frodo, but... I think, I think he has finally come around to the idea that, like, he has always been the protector of frodo yeah he promised that from the beginning he didn't really know how to fulfill that role now he kind of has a better idea yeah but he's also i think starting to really understand that like mary and pippin are too young to be out here doing this and this is really a dangerous journey and it really happened after he was with them cooking yes on um uh kirith Ungu. yeah weathertop yeah weathertop (laughs) yeah i forget some of the names i don't remember but yeah, I mean it's it's really a it's the drastic shift in his character, which they said in real life that's how Sean Aston really was. He was a fatherly role to both Elijah Wood and uh we forgot to say who the fuck played Mary and Pippin. You mean Mary and Pippin didn't play themselves? No. Um <laughs> it was Billy Boyd who played Pippin and um where the fuck is Marion on the top of IMDB? <laughs> the fuck? IMDb, you have failed us greatly. <laughs> IMDb has removed him from here. No, he's he's way further down. <laughs> Dominic Monaghan plays Mary. <laughs> hey, he is above Viggo Mortensen, at least on the full cast and credit page. Oh, gosh, yeah. They didn't even put them next to each other. He's way down there. Even Rosie's above him. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, that's funny. Um... But yeah, so he he was very uh, fatherly to all the hobbits. Yes, um, especially Elijah Wood, which uh, they, they they gave him so much shit in the in the uh, interviews about being a busybody about safety. And... He really was though. 
Which, if I if I remember right, Sean Astin is much older than any of the other Hobbits. Yeah, they were all... It, it's weird because, like, this is one of the times where we talk about how actors end up, like, just becoming the, the roles they're playing. Yeah. Like, the Harry Potter franchise, those kids kind of grew up being those people. Uh-huh. This kind of worked in the reverse. Like, they cast people so perfectly that everyone kind of, like, just became that embodiment yeah. of their character yeah because elijah wood was really elijah wood was a child actor yeah um but i think he was like 18 for this movie he was young for this movie yeah he was very very young and it, it's fun it's funny because uh we talk about that Liv tyler mentioned that she was she was kind of like motherly to orlando bloom because mm-hmm. she's like Oh, he's a little baby actor. He's brand new. The baby elf. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> um, but who jumps out of planes? <laughs> good on him. But ah, <laughs> oh, the thrill-seeking days. <laughs> uh, never had those. But we have a little bit more conflict between Boromir and Aragorn, as though they have a little bonding moment. They they're still men of different cloth. Yeah, and. No matter how you cut it, Boromir's has to be faithful to Gondor. Yeah. Like, that's all he knows. Yeah, they're his people. He wants to make sure that they're safe. And in his own words, he's tired of seeing them die for nothing. Yep. And in his eyes, this would be the best way to help. Like, not only would they be getting the Ring of Power, but they'd be getting their king back. Error or Boromir feels very much like the... Um... His his view of the his people feel like the scouting force in Attack on Titan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Where like every time they come back, a little less people. Yeah, yeah. He, he's tired of the city being tired of dying. Yeah, and so now it's back to boating. Row, row, row. We pass the Agaranths. So cool. They are. Some of the most beautiful parts in this movie. Uh, yeah, hands down. I wish they were real. Um, and they are by far the most impactful pieces of Numenorean architecture that we have seen up to this point. They are at least the most intact. Yeah. War note, they are important because this marked the edge of the Numenorean Empire in the Second Age. Yes. Um, before their downfall. Yeah, you know, before everyone died. Before Isildur fucked up. Whoops. Yeah. Um, and if you look closely, there are parts where the rocks were supposed, it's supposed to feel like they were carved out to a point and then they transitioned to blocks higher up. Mm -hmm. And from the overall shots, you can kind of see an overgrown, overgrown areas where like they were quarrying Mm -hmm. right from the rock face next to them. Yeah. It's beautifully detailed. It is amazing. And, um, now they decide, now they continue, they decide to rest and, Frodo is confronted by Boromir in the Parth Gallon. Because, you know, it wasn't creepy before. No. Now we gotta make it creepy. Yeah, which I I think it's so great the way they've set this up. Because Boromir is following in the footsteps of uh, the... Uh, Isildur? Isildur, the Numenorians. Yes. Um, because... Where it's set, they're surrounded by fallen statues in a mm-hmm. heavily wooded land. Yes. That whatever city or structure was there has been long gone. Yeah, and forgotten. Yeah. it's And I love this because they talk about, they wanted to create like Middle Earth as kind of a forgotten history for England. Mm-hmm. But in a way, Middle Earth has its own ancient ruins. Yes. That also at the same time make the Agaranths much more impressive. Yes. Um, also, fun fact, the remnants were, uh, the remnants of other sets that they used, so. You know, gotta recycle. Yeah, save save those pennies here and there. Um, but it's such a fitting setting for Boromir's fall. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's, especially once you, like, dig into, like, where they are, who was there before Mm -hmm. them, it's such, like, a, a precursor to Boromir himself. Yeah. And how, like, there is, no matter what he does, this there is no coming out of this. Exactly. There is no right answer for Boromir. Well, and exactly, because there's that also moment where he has that, where he goes to grab for the ring. And in uh, right after he's, he, he kind of has that quick regret moment of like, oh, shit, it, I yeah. shouldn't have done that. Like, that was, that was the bad move. I've fallen. Yeah. 
But at the same time, from Boromir's perspective, there is no winning in this. He, no. He either turns against the Fellowship or he turns against Gondor. Yeah. And he's going to turn against the Fellowship. Yeah. Yeah, which... Because as we learned in the second movie, the Gondor was everything to him. Yep. More so than even his asshole father. Yep. And um, Frodo manages to get away, but... uh. Bor- but uh, Boromir realized that, hey, there's orcs on the way. Um, and the least I can do is protect. Yeah. I've got to take as many of these bitches out with me as I can. Try to. Well, a l- that happens a little bit after. Sorry. Because um, Frodo runs into Aragorn, where Aragorn is basically given an even more trying trial, where Frodo's like, if you, you want the it. ring, take it. Yeah. Because you haven't asked for it at all. Yeah, you're the one you, person he trusts. You should be carrying The one man he trusts. Yes. You should be carrying it. And Aragorn's like, no. Nope, don't. Do not do this to me. Well, it's not even like, don't do this to me. It's like, because he, he, Aragorn knows exactly what's going to happen. He's like, I would have followed you to the end, my friend. Yes. And so. I he, also think it helps that Aragorn has spent at this point decades denying mm -hmm. himself power of any kind yeah and but it also just shows that yes he might be the son or the great great grandchild of Isildur the ruler the rightful heir 20th cousin second removed from his lovey girl elf chick yeah 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 um but yeah he's very much so like it it, it, I think it's a big showing moment of him as a character because He could have, he's, if if he had followed his ancestors, mm-hmm. he would have taken the ring. Yes. But he doesn't. Yeah. He knows better. Yes. And he it, has learned. And this is repeated later on where we have another tempting of another human character. Mm-hmm. And they, they're, they're more tempted, but they still have the fortitude not to fall for the, the easy track. way out, basically. Yeah. And that, that's, the, that's the whole thing about the ring. The ring offers... A quote-unquote easy way out. Yes, exactly. A, per, a supposed easy way out that never follows through. Yeah. It's like cursed objects you see in, like, horror movies of, like... This is why you don't pick up random shit. Or do. It's yeah. fun to see ghosts. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> From here, we hear we see that the orcs are coming. Frodo unsheathed, sting, and it's glowing. Uh... Um, In this moment, I mean, we also see some growth, too, because Merry and Pippin are... They've they they've matured a little bit. Yes, they've grown a little as warriors because they watch Frodo. Frodo's they all hide. Frodo's hiding with near them. Mm-hmm. And they're like, "Hey, come here!" And he's like, "No." And Pippin's like, well, "Why isn't he coming?" And Mar- Mary, being the mature one, yeah. is like, "He's leaving." Yeah, he's got to do this. Yeah, it's like they're all realizing, like, "Hey, shit isn't working." Yeah, and like it's it's kind of a weird build up too because there's not really any internal dialogue there there's just this kind of understanding of like like they all knew this was coming yeah yeah it was the inevitable end of this partnership yeah um but they they act as distraction and uh jackson mentioned he adding the farewells allowed the ending of the movie to be heavier yes rather than like oh well we find out two movies later that fro that Marion Pippin learned that Frodo went off on his own. Yes. This this really does help solidify because if we hadn't had each character to some extent mm-hmm. acknowledge that like this is the end of the party, we are standing here to give time for him to go. Yeah. Then this would have been really awkward as a finishing point. For the first movie, because by this point, if you watched this in theaters, you were about to pee your pants. Yeah, again, bring back the intermission, please. Yes, need it. Um, but Boromir falls for the halflings. Yep. Which beautiful poetic. It is moment. It is expertly shot death scene. It oh is yeah. So like it reminds me of the um paintings of like the knights and the fair ladies from museums where it's like he's standing there too many arrows mm. but still going yeah like he yeah feels a like warrior's a... death yes yeah and i i really like this moment too because it, it is heavy because we've realized boromir's redeemed himself mm-hmm. but it's too late in his they, they might and have, he knows it yeah and they might have lasted fighting against all the orcs together yeah but it, he just falls. And, Eric, and he at least gets to fall warning the others. He gets yep. to blow his horn one last time. Yep. 
And Aragorn comes in kicking Urukai ass. And then gets his own ass kicked just a little bit. Because, a little bit. Because we do need some tension. Like that, uh, I love the part where they throw the shield. And it just happens to be a perfectly neck sized <laughs> hole. Yeah. Yeah. I do too. Or it gets embedded in the tree enough so that way it doesn't <laughs> yes. uh, break his windpipe. <laughs> yes. Perfect time. Again, w- when you said like there's that level of battle comedy in this movie. Yes. There's that perfect amount where it doesn't feel over the top. No. And honestly, the first time you watch it, the battle comedy is easy to ignore. Mm-hmm. And then the second, third, sixth, tenth time you watch it, it's easier to focus in on those moments and like really dial in onto yeah. each m- each movement. And be like, that was a cool moment. You, yes. It was still, it might have been stupid, but it was fun. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's the good thing about balancing um, the movie that Peter Jackson really did that. Mm-hmm. Again, as Tolkien said, his writings aren't meant for no, his, adaptation. His battle writing was honestly kind of dry. Yep. It wasn't action-packed like how we a lot of times see writing for sword fighting and action now. Yeah. It was more warlike. Yeah. More and- battle style as opposed to like cool action and fighting yeah the legolas did not do flips and cool swords surfing no no not at all i mean i don't think legolas was in the book too terribly much either uh no no he no. wasn't he's just there to represent the elves he was participating i'm doing my part <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> um but as aragorn goes to uh confront Bo- or comfort boromir in his di- in his dying days mm-hmm. dying breaths moments um we also er- there there's a couple of things i do love that boromir straight up says i would have followed you my friend my king yes there's that very moving moment of boromir ultimately though he was tempted by the ring in duty to his father and homeland, more duty to his father, I'd say. I would agree. Um, he still is loyal to Aragorn. Yes. And the fellowship to a point. And he's loyal to Aragorn as a friend first. Yes. And a king second. Yep. And um, th- this moment, especially for Aragorn in the movie, is massive because now he is the sole human. Yep. Uh, he 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 realizes he can't leave everything to the stewards no he has to take action and this is his first steps towards being kingly yes um because and this will come up in a just a bit because now he's carrying the burden of his allies um frodo goes away he grabs it the he starts rowing out with the boat and samwise starts chasing after him and frodo's like no i gotta do this on my own samwise is the quintessential labrador retriever boyfriend yes which for me, immediately forgets that he can't swim, starts to drown. Bless his little heart. And Frodo pulls him out of the boat in a very nice technique that is called, uh, and that's used for underwater in these movies, is called dry for wet technique that uses fans, smoke, and filters, and other lighting techniques to simulate being in water while being on an actual set. It looks very good. And it's very, it follows the lines of them trying to keep it picturesque. Yes. Because it doesn't react the same way water normally would. No, it's it's almost poetic. In, yeah. In how serious this is. Yeah. And um, they make it across the, bo- they make it across the river. Sam is like, you've, you idiot, but you're, you're, you're here with me now. Can't, yeah. can't do, can't go back. Ha ha, sucker. You're trapped with me now. <laughs> um, and so they make it across. Boromir is sent down the river and the fellowship is now broken. Yep. Um, and oh, shit. Merry and Pippin are gone. Yeah. Whoopsie. Uh, also, kudos to the props people because the Boromir on the boat is a rubber model to the point of like, people are like, people are approaching the uh, special effects guys and they're like, you know, Bo- you know, uh, Sean Bean. He's been laying there quite a while. He <laughs> you okay? Gonna check on him? But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He looks stellar. Yeah, which in in shot they had to. Uh, oh, actually, in his dying shots, they actually digitally drained the color from his face very cleanly and well done. Yes. Um, but now the trio is ready to head east as Frodo and Samwise head west, uh, or opposite. Mordor, yeah, Mordor is east. They're heading. They're, they're they're going in different ways. Yes, um, 
but there are there's some nice little soft focus close ups of Frodo and Samwise in this yeah. moment. Um, but also a nice little touch that shows just shows how Mortensen brings something to his characters. Mm-hmm. Um, he he came up with the idea of incorporating Boromir's armlets in the way to like carry on his fellow yes. man to add to his costume. Yes. And god damn it's is he so, good with what he so does. So good. So the credits roll on the first installment of The Lord of the Rings. Yes. And I mean honestly this this movie was so monumental. And I I do want to say most of the legacy for the final episode just because it it all, really does hit as a threesome. Yeah. I mean, but this movie was impactful. We hadn't seen anything like this. Yes. And I have a feeling if it hadn't done as well, they might have cut the last two. I could see where the budget could have been removed. Yeah. Because they were putting a lot of faith that this was going to be good. Exactly. And luckily for them, it was. It was tremendously good. But can we talk about the music? Yes, that is exactly what Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about next. Because I'm, everyone knows I'm not that musically inclined. But, but how can you ignore the music oh my to God. this movie? The score by Howard Shore. He is... It is a masterpiece. It Outside is... of the movie, it is a masterpiece. Oh, I've, I've listened to it. I've listened to it live stuff. in orchestras. I am jealous, actually. It is phenomenally good music. And the way that it all ties everything together mm-hmm. without taking different motifs anywhere. Like, there's not yeah. like a sea salty song there's not a pop song anywhere there's yeah. there's no change in style it's all heavy it's all orchestral yep and there's those bright moments too especially like the the shire music is mm-hmm. probably my favorite but also like they talk about the fellowship a theme yes the only time we fully hear it is when the fellowship is formed yes and then we don't ever and i think it swells and uses a good chunk of it when Gandalf falls, mm-hmm. but it's never fully heard again. Yeah. Which is... It's I always, so clever. I'm always fascinated by how people can think musically, just because I don't. But, like, just using up the use of the music and, like, hey, I took these elements and we brought it up to this point, but we never hear them in full ever again in the rest rest of the movies. Yeah. And how many movies can you say with... Music that has no words, there's no catchy song to memorize. You only need to hum a couple of notes for people to go, oh, you, yeah, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Yeah, love that. Yeah, no, and I, I Every think... Every tuba player on this planet attempts to play Lord of the Rings. Well, and it's the same thing of, like, any of these series that are super successful, I think it also stems down to their score a little bit, too. Yeah. Because look at, like, Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Harry a phenomenal P- score. Has its own distinct score. Star Wars has a distinct score. Mm-hmm. It's all these series that they don't use stock music. They just... There's no found music from another artist that they no. pull in. Yeah, it's it's all self-contained genius. Yeah. Every piece of it, down to the music. Yeah, and, I mean, even... It, just not the music, but the sound effects, too. Yes. I mean, they took so much. Like, the Balrog's growls were cinder blocks scraping on wood. Like, yes. But I love that they all take this stuff. And, like, the Amori effects were recorded in abandoned tunnels. Mm-hmm. But I like that because you don't hear that. No, but it adds so much. Mm-hmm. It adds a layer of depth that if it's not there, it really can pull you out of the experience. Yeah. And also, like, the Ring Wraiths, mm-hmm. their sound is terrifying. It is so good. It is Fran Wall screaming with a throat infection. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, whatever works. Well, and on top of that, like, how we talked about, like, the ring has its own voice. Yes. That was actually them, like, putting multiple layers onto a voice to give it, like, whispering. Whispers. Little whispers mm-hmm. in the ear. Um, But, yeah. And also, uh, they... The one also cool thing about what they did is for a lot of the orchestrals, they used Maori and Pacific Islanders from a more uh, uh, Maori choir. Cool. Yeah. And also, for you music nerds out there, and you're, I know you're here, Brian, <laughs> um, Isengard was done in an industrial style at a five-fourths tempo. That's why Isengard has like 
uh, its very own drastic theme. And it feels so different than the rest of the movie. Yeah, but, you, it, but without being, like, its own separate yeah, style. It has a very imminent feeling to it, whereas a it lot of... It has almost a ting to some of the background noises. Yeah, and uh, the all, all the other scores, like, especially the Natural and the Hobbit ones, have a very, I guess, round feeling to yes. their sounds. They're very softer and more brighter compared to that. And they don't have the heavy beat. Yeah. Or the heavy horns. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. All the writing and everything in this movie, the ancient speech and the use of men for the ring race was translated by uh, David Salo. Who did a phenomenal job because he had to do all this by himself. Yeah, which... Good on you, dude. I mean, hell, it led to him doing... This is what he does now. He does his type of scripts for movies. Yeah, and I mean... This helped launch people's interest in learning the Lord of the Rings languages. Yeah, but also I think the biggest, and not not only, because we've looked at this from a nerd lens. Yeah. People who have watched these movies dozens of times. Yes, easily. At just alone for for these reviews. (laughs) Um, But what's important, because Lord of the Rings, this was my introduction to the entire franchise or these movies. Mm -hmm. And... I love the consideration that everyone, all the people who worked on this movie took into it was that this was one made for fans, Mm -hmm. but it was also made for people who had never seen the movie before, where it's not bogged down with lore. The lore is there, it's mentioned, but they move on. And I think that's what's one of the biggest impacts of this movie is that, and why it's so well done, because we have a we watch all these fantasy movies where we have no other sources for them like the movie is the world and they're like oh yes that star that fell down 20 years ago that came from the heavens yeah this doesn't have to do that because if you want to dig you can but you don't need to yeah and i mean honestly i do want to bring this up front because i do i am very biased towards these movies Uh um i mean despite being a big fan of Pokemon and Star Wars for much longer, Lord of the Rings very much for me, especially this first one, starts off as like, for me, it's our generation Star Wars trilogy. Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of how I want to frame the rest of the reviews going forward, because like the very first Star Wars, the first Star Wars is quite rough, mm-hmm. but they refine it and they get better as they go along-ish, Ish. Star Wars-wise. The- for the first trilogy, I will agree with you. Yeah. And then it got weird. Yeah, but... <laughs> we'll, we'll save that for another <laughs> review. But also, I mean, there's just so much stuff to go through. I mean, this, I I just love this movie. I, yes. Even as a standalone movie, it is a solid movie. It's some, some parts haven't aged as well, but it's still overall a good foundation to start everything else that comes after this. Yes, very much. And like, Yes, we we've said a couple times like oh this or this hasn't aged well. That's coming from some from two people who have watched this movie countless times in the last couple months. Yeah. If you're watching it as just a for fun watching it movie, even if you've never seen it before so you have no nostalgia glasses, you're not going to notice the things we noticed no. that aged it because we're sitting here looking at every single detail of this movie. And specifically, we are being nitpicky because of the design work and everything that goes into it. And yeah, we're we're over here looking at the background images for Christ's sake. So. Oh yeah. And I mean it's it just really is there is something in this first movie that's so hopeful and so bright compared to mm-hmm. what's what's to come. And again, we'll get into more of the legacy at the end once we've got all three of them to go through. But for the first one, even once the first one had come out, this movie somehow unified our generation. Yeah. Even people who weren't nerds, who weren't into fantasy, like, this was a talking point for everyone. Mm -hmm. Even if you hadn't seen the movie, everyone could, like, talk about, like, oh, what's your favorite race? Would you want to be a hobbit? (laughs) I might rephrase that. What's your favorite Middle Earth (laughs) race? You know what I mean. (laughs) Um, it's like race wars. Yeah, <laughs> Middle Earth kind of has. A... By race wars, I'm referring to the Fast and the Furious, our last uh, episode. They should have picked a different name <laughs> for the car race. Well, actually, technically, this movie does have race wars. Yes, but again, it like like we said at the beginning, we're like why people thought this was a World War One and Two flick. It's because this guy lived through some very terrible segregation and discrimination and well, and also and, i mean he he lived through 
a completely different time era that we yeah. can't even t- we can't e- we can't even reach back. No, and he captured that in a fantasy world. Yeah, and whether or not he intended to. Yeah, and I mean it just th- there's just something in not not just Tolkien's writings, but the craft because Tolkien's writings are good and they're a good ground source. But, but bringing them to life like this. Yes. That's what made the difference. Exactly. And just, as we mentioned, and part of it was to, as we mentioned, this was called the highest budget indie film ever made. And because mm-hmm. Weta hadn't been really established, Peter Jackson was still an up-and-coming director, mm-hmm. they could take those risks. They could do whatever the hell they really wanted to. And, that, and it really showed that they took the risk. Yes. They tried to do something that firmly established like we have ele- we had elements there but they brought those elements to life and yes. were have and they had no influence from hollywood trying to dictate what they could and what they couldn't do yes and they did it all with such understanding of the source material yes and that i think is what both bothers some people and for everyone else made this world really flourish yeah is not just like retelling, not just reimagining, but a deep understanding of it so yes. that it can be retold their way. One ad ab- one ad or three adaptations to rule them all. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I mean there is something to that because there is there is a level of seriousness treated or taken from it that they knew when to add the comedy and they mm-hmm. knew not to like overreach themselves or like to be on to to be too on the nose with everything yes they kept everything within middle earth yes and it works seamlessly yeah so i mean we'll we'll continue this i mean there's four more episodes to go yep um i'm i'm really looking forward to them i i love the first movie so much but upon rewatching, it it really is just the ground point. Yes, it's really hard to just watch the first one and not immediately go on to the second and then the third. Exactly. Maybe not in the same day, but in a roughly quick time frame. Yeah. So, and I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I, we're next, we're going to, of course, do the two towers. Yes. Um. So, and that's going to be one of the interest, interesting in-between movies. It is, but mostly because it's a lot of just cross-country running. Yes. Yeah. So... But anywho, everyone, thank you for listening to us. This is the end of the first part of the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, got quite a bit more. So Yay. This has been the good, the bad, and the weird. Thanks for listening. Peace. See you in part two or part four. Part three? Part three. Part four if you continue. Keep the intro. I don't know. One of them. Anywho, see you next time. <laughs>